Good morning and welcome to the 19th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Agenda item two. Uh, the second item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence from two panels of stakeholders to explore waste generation and disposal in Scotland. Can I welcome Robin Baird, the Waste Manager of Falkirk Council, Tony Boyle, Divisional Manager, Waste Management and Recycling, Land and Environmental Services, Glasgow City Council, Ian Gullen, the Chief Executive of Zero Waste Scotland, and Rebecca Walker, uh, Manager, Waste and Landfill Tax, Scottish Environment Protection Agency. The members have a number of questions. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So I can, can I remind members and the witnesses that short, sharp questions and short, sharp answers would be extremely helpful. Um, and you don't have to answer every question if you don't feel you have a locus in it. So uh, Alex Burnett, can you kick this off? Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, really, a general theme to, to start off with, and, and maybe if you could go around in turn and each give your views. Um, I'm really asking about what you feel the general trends have been over the last 10 years uh, in regards to waste generation, uh, what data, what your views are on the data collected about it, and what data, uh, could, how that could be improved, any areas of improvement, uh, and finally, what, uh, what you see as the priorities uh, of a hierarchy uh, in improving uh, uh, waste management. So, a very general theme to start with. Uh, could Ian, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, convener, uh, committee, for the opportunity to come today. Uh, so, we quite a lot in that. Uh, so, I guess the question was over the last ten years. So, we have seen a reduction uh, in waste arisings. Uh, over the last 10 years, and total waste risings over the last 10 years, I think uh, the numbers are around uh, a 47% reduction in those 10 years. Uh, and obviously, although one of the challenges I think in the past is this, what we've talked about is the decoupling of waste uh, arisings from uh, economic activity. So I think the, I'm, no econ I'm not an economist, but certainly the economy of Scotland has uh, increased over that period as well. So it's good to see that the trend is in the right direction, that we actually have decoupled waste arisings from uh, economic activity, 47%. Uh, uh, it's quite considerable. I think over the last couple of years, that, that number has, has steadied slightly in terms of waste generation uh, for a number of reasons, I guess. One of, the, one of the things obviously impacts a lot in that number is construction and demolition waste, which is 45% of the total arisings in Scotland. So although there's a lot of that is recycled, uh, and obviously quite a lot of prevention activities are involved in that, the scale of developments uh, can skew those numbers slightly. So some years you can see that although there's, you know, there's not a trend as such because some years it's up, some years it's down, so it's a very steady state over the last couple of four or five years. Uh, certainly from a household point of view, we've increased recycling. Uh, uh, household recycling has increased considerably over that 10 years, as everybody knows. We're now up to around about 44%. Uh, although, again, those numbers are based on 2015 data, so that's one of the, I guess, the challenges we have uh, is the data is always running slightly behind in terms of years, uh, but the, the direction of travel is, is very positive, increasing household recycling. Uh, obviously, probably a lot more recycling is carried out in the commercial and industrial sector, uh, particularly now that the waste regulations have come into force in 2000. And, 14 and then <clears throat> further strengthened in 2016, particularly around food waste. Uh, so you're seeing a lot more commercial recycling and industrial recycling, as well as recycling and construction and demolition. So those are, I guess, all good news stories. Uh, I guess there's still, uh, although the waste arisings have sort of perhaps slowed down in terms of the reductions over the last couple of years, one of the things we have seen uh, from our point of view is a significant increase in the reduction in terms of carbon. So as we start to target uh, key carbon intensive materials, particularly around things like food waste and, and plastics, uh, the actual carbon impact of our waste uh, over that period of time uh, has reduced considerably by about 25% over the last four, four or five years. So I guess this shows that you can look at the tonnages and the sort of weight based uh, approach, but 
with a lot more work being done, particularly with Zero Waste Scotland and other partners around this whole idea of measuring uh, through the carbon metric, uh, looking at the carbon intensity of those materials and providing strategies to target those materials in terms of our climate change ambitions here in Scotland, we actually are seeing another uh, significant uh, impact on different material streams in Scotland. Uh, I mean, it's one of the things key to say, if you look at the, I think one of the other things, the composition of waste. So if you look at it from a uh, weight-based uh, prerogative, the, the top five materials, sorry, the top five materials in terms of carbon intensity in Scotland are not the, are not the top five materials in terms of weight-based. So it's trying to understand that if we're going to look at the carbon, if we're going to really target the carbon, then those are not the big heavy items in the overall waste stream. Uh, so it's, it's I think more of our work now is trying to ensure that, we, yes, we're focused on the weight-based impacts uh, in terms of uh, our waste management, but also we really need to target initiatives and interventions around those carbon-intensive materials uh, so we can, uh, as I said, realise our, our more wider ambitions around climate change. Sorry, I could keep talking. Sorry. No, I was going to say, does anybody else want to come in on that point? Just from uh, Glasgow, as a microcosm of uh, Scotland, We've similarly seen a decrease in waste overall tonnage in 2007 363,000 tonnes, 2016-17 down to 265,000 tonnes. So quite a significant decrease now. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd oh. like to add one one other thing. It's obviously, you know, you, I think your specific point um, was regarding the last 10 years, and sometimes I think we forget where we've come from. And if we had a look 10 years ago and had this conversation within this very chamber, we'd be we having a different conversation um, in terms of being the, the dirty man of Europe. Now, one of the most forward-thinking uh, nations um, trying to deliver sustainable waste management practices, whether that is through deposit returns or whether it's through enhanced curbside collections. In terms of the one other point I'd like to make is a uh, composition. Uh, Ian touched upon in, in his uh, answer there, you know, the composition of waste it's certainly showing significant changes over the last decade as well. Um, and, you know, and if I asked any of the panel today and the committee how many people bought a paper this morning compared to how many people bought a paper 10 years ago, um, it would be a significant change in itself. So that has changed the composition of waste quite dramatically. Um, a lot of people get deliveries from Amazon now, so you put a lot more cardboard packaging into the waste stream, but a lot less newsprint um, and stuff like that. So that is another significant change in terms of data. Great, thank you. Rebecca Walker. Thanks. I'd just come in on a couple of points and then also talk about the data. Um, at the moment, we have 11.6 million tonnes of waste being generated in Scotland. The most reliable figures are from 2011 to 2015, when SEPA changed their methodology in terms of commercial and industrial waste. So that helped in terms of the reliability by looking at regulatory returns rather than surveying the businesses. Household waste since 2011 to 20, um, 2015 has remained relatively stable at 2.5 million tonnes. Commercial and industrial waste is relatively stable at 3.6 million tonnes, and we see the variability in the and construction and demolition waste mainly due to the economy and the number of infrastructure projects going on. And this has actually varied between 5.5 and 3.8 million tonnes, so quite a significant variation there. But as Ian said, it's a good news story in the construction and demolition sector because we are at a 72% re recycling rate, which exceeds the directive target for 2020 um, for 70%. In terms of um, the waste data, we've, um, ha we do have more reliable trends dating back a decade. So landfill back in um, 2005 was 7.05 million tonnes. It's now at um, 4.1 million tonnes. Again, this is a really good news story. And household waste, we have seen an overall decrease in terms of waste generated. Again, this could be to waste composition in terms of paper. We're seeing a lot less paper, and so the tonnage is less here. We're continuing to strive on your data question to have more accuracy in terms of the data. So we've recently had, um, in the last few years, guidance out to the operators on this, and we're looking at different um, ways we verify. As we come on to online data reporting, I think this will help in terms of the re reliability. Um, and we're actively looking at ways to implement this to make sure it's as reliable as possible. In terms of the waste hierarchy, 
it's all about, to me, the right tools, the right levers, and a mix of them in the right place. There's no single thing. We need to look at what we're doing across the hierarchy, from landfill tax to move it away from landfill, but then all our interventions around recycling, such as producer responsibility regulations, the way Scotland regulations, putting the um, requirement on the producers to separate their waste. Also, in terms of working with um, the reuse sector and manufacturing, we have a very, very comprehensive government strategy. In terms of the way it covers the hierarchy, I'd say it's the most comprehensive in the UK because it does cover reuse, remanufacturing, right, and then gives the landfill its place as well. So we're lucky to have such a comprehensive strategy with tools across it to have those interventions. But again, there is more we can do. We need to understand what's coming out of our commercial and industrial sectors so that we know opportunities for the future to keep these materials in the economy and get the best value from them. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's move this on. Can I ask, from your perspective, how achievable the 2025 target to recycle 70% of all Scotland's waste is and what we will need to do in practice if we are to achieve that? Who wants to go first? Robin Baird. So thank you, convener. I'm happy to start that. Um, as we sit here today, it's unachievable. Um, <clears throat> it sounds a, a sort of striking thing, but we'd need to do a lot more to create the instruments that we have. Um, we have come a long way in the last few years, but I, I certainly think if you look at the waste data, we're starting to plateau in terms of um, how we're performing as a nation. So that has to be of a concern approaching 2021 with the landfill ban. So we really need to sit and take a, this is a good opportunity to take a step back and learn the lessons of the last 10 years, what's worked, what's not worked, and what we need to do to move forward. If you look at most of the high performing uh, recycling rates across Europe, a lot of them have um, direct variable charging in place for the residual waste. Unfortunately, if unless we seriously look at how we manage that residual waste, and especially I'm talking about from a householder level, and how people take that seriously, um, then it's going to be pushing something uphill. Um, we have, in Falkirk, moved to a four-weekly residual waste collection to try and take out as much of the recycling as possible because we have other collections in place that allow people to fully separate their waste. Yet 25 to 30 per cent of our residual waste could still have been recycled um, using the services we provide. So there's, there's a long way to go in terms of what to do. Um, this is the first step, having committees like this to make those conversations. Um, but I'm going to kind of put a challenge out to the committee. Um, and it's really how serious are we in wanting to achieve those targets? Because that will determine how serious we are to make the right decisions to, to change the behaviour that we see out there. Some of those decisions that you will have to make won't be popular, um, especially initially. But we have to take it and take the wider view and say, is it the right thing to do rather than the popular thing to do? And that's a challenge, I'm afraid, that is going to be put back to the committee. Let me throw a question back at you. The variable performance of councils across Scotland in this area, how much of that's down to the public and how much of it's down to the councils themselves and how they approach the issue? Well, I mean, every council has recycling provision um, at, at their doorstep. Um, so... Many would argue that the householder has the ability to make the right choice at the, at the, dis, at the disposal point. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of both, you know, and I don't think any council would sit here today and say that we have perfected the communication to our residents. Um, have we made it as easy as possible? Again, we'd be open to debate. Um, but at the end of the day, we cannot influence, um, when it comes to it, we cannot make a householder do something that they don't want to do. Um, both Rebecca and uh, Ian mentioned the Waste Scotland regulations. The most frustrating thing that I have always said within uh, presentations in committee was we so badly missed a trick with the Waste Scotland regulations. If you really read those regulations, in brackets, it says except householders. Does that strike you as really being serious about something when we exclude something so crucial as householders to, to make them recycle. And that, to me, is a challenge I'd throw back. Why was those brackets put in there? If I, if I Tony Boyle. Come in there as well, that I'll just to echo Robin's point. We seem to have given um, the biggest waste um, creators in terms of domestic, you know, householders, a get-out-of-jail card 
and we compare the Environmental Protection Act 1990 to what it became amended to, there's a specific um, issue in there that talks about, and if you'll let me quote, it shall from 1st of January 2014 be the duty of any person who produces controlled waste, brackets, other than the occupier of domestic property as respects household waste produced on a property, to take all reasonable steps to ensure the separate collection of dry waste. Glasgow City Council at many councils is trying its level best to encourage and engender recycling. And it can, you can only take it so far. You could lead a horse to a well, but you can't make it drink. Um, we are doing a lot in terms of trying to get residents to do it, but they're not compelled to recycle. And it's very, very difficult. It's one thing doing communication, done a lot of work with Zero Waste and CEPA over the last couple of years in trying to encourage recycling. But we fall short in terms of being able to get the resident to actually actively take up. And being on my soapbox for a second, what compounds it is some of the quite unique problems that Glasgow faces in terms of housing stock. We've got 160,000 flats. The people who live in flats, as opposed to the 125,000 who have a curbside service, have got a completely different level of recycling opportunities. You must, if you stay in a flat, for example, like I do, you've got to walk around to a public recycling point to dispose of your glass, whereas if you stay in a curbside property, you've actually got a bespoke glass bin you can use. So a lot of stuff we could be doing in terms of encouraging residents, but also tied to that is infrastructure, ensuring there's enough infrastructure and indeed the budget for that infrastructure for councils to utilise. Surely, and, and accepting that, very much accepting that point you've just made, the variable approach of councils doesn't help either. So, for example, uh, in Angus, you can recycle your glass at the curbside, but in Aberdeenshire, you have to take it round the corner to a, a, another facility. So, um, to what extent does that contribute to the problem? Quite significantly, I would say, but it's kind of horses for courses. When you look at Falkirk, no disrespect to Falkirk, but it's tiny in comparison to Glasgow. So Glasgow is dealing with 600,000 residents. It's dealing with unique issues. It's under major financial pressure in terms of budgets. At a time we're looking at reduced frequencies of household uplifts as part of our economic solution, as much, of, uh, as much as an environmental solution. But then again, Glasgow has taken the kind of leap in terms of residual waste treatment solution. So we looked at the whole issue about landfill bans and you know curtailing of that 10 years ago and worked on a progressive solution for that. Yet yeah, it will cost us more to provide that solution than it would if we are going to landfill. I, I want to open this up to the rest of the panel, but let's, let's stick with the local authorities at the moment. I'll let you in in a second, Robin Vair. Let's just assume that we did move to a deposit return scheme. What impact would that have on your activities around curbside recycling? And what is the danger if a danger exists, of councils seeking to roll back from curbside recycling where they couldn't, when they couldn't access glass and plastic, for example? Um, first of all, I'd like to go back to your point, uh, convener, about the consistency aspect. And I think, you know, the, the council's commitment is reflected by, I believe, you know, you can confirm that, that 25 local authorities have signed the Household Recycling Charter. But I'll give you an example. Food waste. We collect food waste weekly. Pretty much a majority of other councils collect food waste weekly. It can't get any simpler. It's in a caddy every week. Yet we only get 55 to 60% participation in that service. How, how simple can it be? Grey caddy, every week, all food waste. That's quite consistent with how other local authorities provide, yet we can barely get 50% efficiency from our house, uh, householder level. So consistency because of the recycling chart and the fact that we, we've signed it, is a big part, but I think it's what we need to be careful of. It will not be the sole solution. Um, going back to your, your other question regarding deposit returns, I think prior to this at the evidence gathering session, um, I am a strong proponent is you cannot sp pay, spend the same pound twice. So if you're doing deposit returns and you're having an established collection, are you assuming that that's not going to work? Because if it's not going to work, you have to then have a curbside collection service. If it is going to work, you don't need a curbside collection service because that waste won't be within the waste stream of the, the, the Tony and I deal with. So if you're setting up a deposit scheme, you have to the A, decide, is it going to work? If it is, then B, local authorities can't put resources in to collect material that shouldn't exist for collection. Would local authorities roll back completely from curbside recycling of other items? That's what I'm getting at. That's my concern. 
can I come in there? I don't ever see that being an issue in terms of dry and mixed recycle alone that it's not plastic bottles, for example. There's always going to be a requirement for that level of collection. What I think there is an interesting point being made about the waste uh, charter in terms of trying to have a one-size-fits-all for every local authority. And quite simply, there's winners and losers out of that. And I would suggest that Glasgow is pretty much a significant loser in terms of trying to adjust its infrastructure to suit that when we've got this large amount of flatted housing stock. I think one thing that we should be maybe considering for the future is looking towards Europe and European models with these continental bins. Most of you have probably been holiday like I have in Europe and you don't see these 240 litre individual wheel bins. You see these larger containments, sometimes underground containment. And there has to be a kind of serious look at that in terms of trying to move forward to some sort of, if we're looking at a uniform system, that is, um, that will bring economies of scale will bring certain advantages, but we, it doesn't get us away from this issue. Even with a deposit return scheme, we need to engender some responsibility within individuals within their own household to do the right thing. Robin made the point about the food waste, for example. 30-40% of the food waste, even given we provided an individual food waste collection scheme, is not being recycled. So people are still disregarding that and putting that into their general waste bin, so it doesn't help. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, well, let's allow the other two witnesses to answer this question, and we'll come back to something else. Ian Golland. On the deposit? No, on, on the, the, the original question. Sorry, we moved on for it. How achievable is the 2025 target? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because uh, obviously the 70% target in 2025 is all waste. So if you look at the numbers to some extent, you know, at the moment, although it's a 44% uh, household, the actual recycling rate for Scotland is about 57 to 59%. Uh, so, as, you know, as Rebecca said, you know, high recycling and the things like the construction industry or the commercial industry can pull up that number from the household. Uh, but having said that, to support my colleagues to the left, you know, although household waste is only 25% by weight, it's actually 53% by carbon. So we really need to start seriously thinking about how do we increase the recycling rate in the household uh, to a much more significant level because that's where the carbon intensity things. Uh, and again, that, but that number is hard. Uh, I mean, a lot of it is because a lot of the waste prevention activity that goes on, we've already mentioned paper, uh, although that's to some extent a trend rather than any specific uh, intervention by government. Uh, but a lot of the stuff, particularly even in the commercial sector, a lot of the waste prevention activity is taking out, with every respect, some of the easier to recycle materials like paper. So therefore it makes the actual recycling number harder to achieve because you're taking away that opportunity. So I think there is a, a probably moment in time to look at the target uh, in terms of what we're actually trying to achieve. Is that the right, is it weight based 70% or are we looking to try and achieve some other uh, outcome for Scotland? And I guess. You know, since that target was put in place, we have shifted our thinking around carbon. We've re recognised the opportunities to, you know, in terms of our carbon uh, ambitions. Uh, clearly, we now have a circular economy strategy. So this is not all about just recycling for whatever well, respect the sake of recycling. You know, this is about putting in place systems and processes and infrastructure in Scotland that can re reap the benefit uh, for the economic and social as well as environmental benefits in terms of making things last longer for our economy, rather than, with every respect, exporting the bulk of our material. We export over 70% of the materials that are collected for recycling in Scotland to other, other economies. Uh, and if you start to look at the job implication for every one job in recycling, uh, it's accepted there's another eight jobs further up that uh, sort of processing stream in terms of reprocessing, remanufacturing, resale, resupply of those materials back into your economy. That's the real prize that we're trying to do. To, to realise here for Scotland in terms of our circular economy ambitions. So I think it's now is the time to really think about how to, you know, what are we actually trying to, with every respect, chase in terms of targets? What's the outcome we're actually trying to achieve for Scotland? And it, I think there's much more focus now on the carbon implications of, of different waste streams, different materials, and what they can actually do for our economy in terms of jobs and prosperity. Uh, so that's probably just something to, to consider as well. Just picking up on that point, I, I'm interested in, in the impact of activities that are coming down the track. Oil rig decommissioning, for example, I wonder if you've done any work around that, because there's a lot of talk about the jobs it creates, and yet I've been briefed of a, a case in England where there's only 12 jobs once the rig involved when the rig actually comes ashore. So essentially, much of what can be recycled and reused is stripped out in the North Sea, then the rig's brought here. Um, 
What concerns do we have about the impact of any extensive decommissioning work that's carried out in Scotland in terms of you know, waste going to landfill? My understanding is there's only one suitable site in Scotland for this type of material. Yeah, I mean, I think Super will probably know a bit more about the, the facilities that are available, but we have done some work. We, uh, we've done some uh, an analysis of the opportunities around the circular economy uh, in the decommissioning opportunities in the North Sea. Uh, certainly, the bulk of the material, the bulk of the infrastructure that will come ashore will be recycled. A lot of it is obviously metal, uh, and there's, there is infrastructure in play in Scotland already to, to cut up that stuff, for a better word, uh, at the harbour side. Uh, and to all intents and purposes, send those materials off to other, again, uh, most of it leaves Scotland to be processed in other parts of the world. Uh, so that, that happens, that's good for the environment, I guess, uh, but there are opportunities there for the reprocessing of some of those materials, even the steel uh, here in Scotland, but also the reuse, remanufacture, repurposing of some of that, that equipment, some of the high value equipment when it comes on shore. So instead of just every, you know, fragmenting it up, cutting it all up, and then chipping it off for recycling. And that's something that the oil industry is very keen on now, to look at that, because, the, the, again, the value is for, you know, it's about a 15-fold increase in terms of the value opportunity, both in terms of materials, products, uh, and obviously parts of the oil rig, so to speak, and subsea infrastructure, but in jobs. And that's, we've been working with a number bulk of... Bulk of ashore would be recycled. Yeah, the bulk of it, I think, I mean, I can't remember the figure, but it's very high 90s that a okay. lot of that material is actually recycled in terms of steel infrastructure, as you can imagine, and some of the stuff that's subsea. Uh, but it's recycled, and it's not reused or repurposed, and a lot of that doesn't happen in Scotland. Our job is really to dismantle it and cut it up. So, that, again the high value jobs would be to reprocess that stuff, remanufacture it. And there's a lot of companies we've been talking to in, in the North East and around Scotland, because the whole supply chain that puts the stuff out to the North Sea okay. is, is Scotland wide. It's not all based in the North East. So there are opportunities uh, all, all down the East Coast, uh, Montrose, Dundee, uh, and further afield that could really see an opportunity to repurpose some of that equipment back into the North, back into the North Sea or to other oil uh, installations across the world. Okay, great. Rebecca Walker, do you want to come in on that? Um, yeah, we, uh, we recognise the value that's going to come on shore from the oil and gas sector of the materials. Um, we've identified oil and gas decommissioning as one of our first sectors that we're looking at through our sector approach in SEPA. Um, we're working with Scottish government to make sure we have um, facilities that, and the capability to bring these materials on shore to dismantle in Scotland and to get the added value for the Scottish economy within a strong environmental protection framework. Um, as Ian said, a lot of this material will still go abroad. Um, in terms of our exports, paper, plastic, metals, both ferrous and non-ferrous, do get exported in terms of the majority of them. We don't have the reprocessing facilities in Scotland, but in terms of oil and gas decommissioning, we are in a position to have the facilities in Scotland that can do the dismantling and the added value at that part of the supply chain. In terms of at home, we tend to keep more of the heavier um, materials such as the inner, the aggregate, the soils, glass, organic, they're recycled, reprocessed domestically, and we have um, a good circular economy supply chain working in Scotland on that. Um, as Ian mentioned, in terms of tonnages and recycling, it probably shouldn't be looked at in isolation. We do have to look at all the factors here within an environmental protection framework. We need to look at the economic benefits and also acknowledge that we work within global markets with energy costs and labour costs that have to be taken on board as well in terms of where we make the interventions and what's best for Scotland in terms of Scotland's environment, society and economy here. Um, as well as quantity, so at the moment we're at 57% across, across the economy in terms of recycling with the 70% target in 2025. So in terms of being on track, we are. But as we strive for that higher quantity, we must address quality because this is where we'll get the secure markets in terms of sustainable markets and have, um, and have the economic benefit from these materials as much as protecting the environment. What a school. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, first of all, I should declare an interest uh, with respect to my previous role in Zero Waste Scotland. Um, just on uh, oil and gas decommissioning, just a couple of points. I wonder if you could provide an update, if you have it, on the ability of Scotland to uh, decommission a platform that's uh, via, taken off via a single lift, as opposed to piece large or piece small. 
And uh, secondly, I wondered uh, what the panel's thoughts were with respect to the utilisation of an electric arc furnace for recycling steel, perhaps, um, as a result of the oil and gas platforms coming from the North Sea. Um, I'd like to, in terms of the single lift and the capability in Scotland, could I please um, provide written evidence at a later date on this so that you have the accurate details around this? Excellent. So, yeah, I, sorry, I don't have that information. Uh, so, that is something, the idea of electric art furnace uh, in Scotland looking at that steel is, 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 a, is a live proposal, I guess. That is something that we, as Zero Waste Scotland and amongst other partners, have, have looked at. We've done some feasibility work at a high level to understand what that would look like in terms of inputs and outputs and obviously uh, you know the fact it's electric and how that could uh, power could be generated particularly from renewables uh, in terms of the carbon uh, carbon envelope that we'd all like to work in uh, both at an industrial level but at a national level here in Scotland uh, so it is you know that is a project that is definitely feasible in Scotland. It obviously needs a number of other partners uh, to come together and have that broader discussion about how that could, could be done. And that would be something that, as I know, uh, we're, we're involved in, and I'm sure others uh, are involved in as well. Claudia Beamish. Convener, and good morning to the panel. I mean, the decommissioning, I'm very pleased the conveners uh, raised this issue. And uh, I, I would just like to direct a short supplementary to, to you, Rebecca, and possibly Ian as well. Uh, um, although perhaps Paul Kirk and Glasgow might have, but we keep this brief. But I, I was a bit concerned when you think about the time trajectory in relation to decommissioning the oil industry and the development of <coughs> marine renewables, you know, moving to the low carbon economy, that um, I think you, you just said, Rebecca, that um, it was important. I, you know, I can't exactly quote it, but what, what um, we could do here and what was going to be exported, it seemed almost like it was a fait accompli that there would be some reprocessing that just was going to continue to be exported. Could you comment any further on that, please? Um, at the moment, we don't have the facilities in, I terms, of, that, yeah, in terms of the yeah, investment yeah. for reprocessing in Scotland. So we're focusing on making sure we can bring the material into Scotland and the added value that we can get from it there. Um, in terms of investments in Scotland, I think we have to give that certainty around regulation to attract businesses. I can't really um, comment further. I guess in terms of the global markets, the energy costs and um, the labour costs, we're looking at all options that get the best value for Scotland in terms of the economy and the environment here. And we're working with partners on this. So we've been working closely with Zero Waste Scotland, um, with Scottish Government, and we also work with the enterprise agencies on this. Can you just clarify that, that point a little bit? Um, my understanding is that the oil companies will take the rigs to wherever's nearest uh, for decommissioning purposes. So I guess the question is, would we have sufficient raw material available in Scotland to justify the spend on the infrastructure that would be required? And I don't have the detail in terms of a um, sort of a cost-benefit analysis around that. I'd be happy to look to see if we could get that information for you. Yeah, that'd be useful to have. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's move this on. Mark Roscoe. Yeah, thanks, convener. If we could go back to households again. Um, I can ask you a question about the Charter for Household Recycling. You've already touched on this briefly. Do you see it as, as significant in terms of driving up performance and the recycling rate? And also, do you see any conflicts within the Charter? So, for example, looking through at some of the, um, the outcomes, um, one of the high-level outcomes is about quantity, ensuring that there's high quantities, but also as high quality. Now, I'm just wondering if there's conflicts between some of these. Um, also, the third objective is about cost-effectiveness. So, to what extent does cost-effectiveness mean high quality and high quantity? So, just interested in your, in your views about that. I think certainly in terms of um, quality, the more provide the waste charter basically espouses that you give a wider range of recycling facilities to more members of the public, in short. Uh, and what we've noticed when we've introduced recycling initiatives in Glasgow to mainly the curbside properties, if you give them a dry mix recycle, a blue bin, they will use it more than they would have, you know, try to separate through public sites before. The problem we've got is how do we actually do that in practice equally right across all of the residents? Very, very difficult. In terms of cost effectiveness, 
That's the biggest challenge for Glasgow. If you use Glasgow as an example, it's not cost effective to roll this service out. I just flip back, back for a second to the foodway service. We've introduced a foodway service as we're obliged to do under the way Scotland regulations in the last couple of years. Now that has resulted in us having to, the good news is we've created 100 new posts. We're having to provide a weekly service in flats for food waste collections. And this is a sort of example that would be rolled out with the, the wider recycling chart, the reason I'm using that as an example. Now we're providing a weekly service to back courts, people who present their waste to back courts in communal bins, are picking up between maybe five, eight kilograms of waste from those bins. The carbon issues around that, the extra vehicles we've got, the staff, it's not cost effective to do that. So when you look at the wider principle of the waste charter, it sounds great. When you start to drill down to some of the detail of it, it's very, very difficult to see a benefit environmentally from that. And one of the things we could look at, for example, is reduced frequency of collections. But again, I go back to the point I made earlier on. Is it the right fit, the waste charter, for every local authority? I can see benefits in some local authorities, but I don't see it being a one-size-fits-all that will, get, that will reap the same benefits from each local authority. Given the austerity that many local authorities are under at the moment, the obvious need to make savings across the board, do you, do you see that as a significant driver? Is it objective three on cost-effectiveness, which is really driving service reconfiguration. I was going to let Robin come in in a second, if I may, but um, it absolutely cannot uncouple these issues. The economic pressure that local authorities are feeling just now to make ends meet is directly related to how we provide the service. But what we have is well-meaning, well-intended um, initiatives like the Waste Charter, which make it absolutely impossible for us to provide uh, you know, an economic service in terms of what the residents are having to pay, their council tax, and just the council broadly through the support grant to actually provide that service. Very, very difficult to do that. We've got well-meaning environmental, uh, broad-ranging, overarching uh, initiatives. The two things don't meet easily in, in the middle, and I think we've got to look a wee bit more innovatively at how we can actually create solutions that bring both things home. Mm -hmm. At this moment in time, Glasgow will be looking at, you know, uh, various frequencies of collections from the, 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 the common uh, practice we've got just now. But using that food waste example, does it make sense to go around every week to pick up food waste when there's no one actually any requirement to do that? We can maybe do it two or three weekly, so can we bring benefits from that? Mm -hmm. Just as an example. I think th through the chair, I think Robin Baird and then Ian Gulland wanted to come in. So. Yes, no, thank you, Jen. Thank you. I, I think it's a very valid question um, in terms of the current climate, but I think you know, the aim of the today is to think differently uh, and act differently. And the question remains is, if the current funding mechanism stays in place, then no. Um, local authorities um, are sitting there having to look at what statutory services aren't they going to deliver shortly. Um, but that's assuming that the funding mechanism that we currently have is the way it's going to go. And the question comes, who should pay to collect material? Um, should it be the local authority or should it be uh, a contribution through the packaging industry, um, whether that's through a DRS system or through other means? There is no doubt waste collection is inherently underfunded. Let's make no mistake about that. I was asked a question by a resident. Um, they wanted a refund um, on his council tax because we missed a few collections. And it turned out per collection, the, the householder paid nine pence out his council tax, nine pence. Tony's right, that's not enough to collect the material that we need to collect it to answer your point. That's not going to collect the material in the quality we need it. That's not enough to collect it in the quantity we need it to get the investment that we need. So what we need to look at is how do we fund a service to get the best quality, the best quantity, to create the best infrastructure to make sure everybody knows what they're doing. And that's the question. So if the current, if local authorities are left to it, absolutely. Um, if, if committee chambers across the land are asked to pick between education and bins, I guess what the answer is. It's education first. We need to think differently. We need to get an understanding of what is the best way to collect it. And the charter is the first point of that. There's a general understanding that to get the quality, to get the quantity, we need to be consistent. To go back to the chair's point earlier, 
You need consistency. You need to be able to have clarity to householders to make it easier for them to do it. You then have to have that instrument that allows householders or makes them understand they have to do it. But that might mean the collection has to change. That collection might be expensive, but down the line benefits, like economic investment in the circular economy, might make that investment worthwhile. But that investment, if it's local authorities doing the collection, needs to be properly funded. Okay. Do you, can I just let, I think Morris Goldwyn's got a, a brief supplementary just on that on a point that was just yeah. made. Uh, yes, thanks, Kevin. Mr. Boyle, just on some of your comments with respect to collections, um, I mean, I'm aware from working with other local authorities and indeed um, municipalities across <coughs> Europe that the business case can always be made to introduce food waste collections by changing the frequency of other collections, by rerouting, uh, by having a comprehensive communications campaign, and in Scotland's case, by uh, accessing funds via the Scottish Government, primarily through Zero Waste Scotland. Uh, I'm unclear why uh, Glasgow is so different, given that other local authorities indeed Edinburgh and uh, Inverclyde, which has many of the same uh, housing stock, uh, have, have managed to roll out and are doing very well in terms of uh, recycling infrastructure. I appreciate that at this moment in time, uh, prices for recycling are low, but in the long term, um, I would expect those prices to rise and therefore it would make sense to have the appropriate collections and infrastructure to uh, accommodate that. I um, just wonder if you could perhaps clarify some of your previous comments. Yeah, well, the, the, the food waste that we are picking up in terms of the, you know, the volume of that is similar to most local, other local authorities in Scotland, but it's not a high volume in terms of what we're picking up. And I don't think there's any local authority in Scotland that's picking up high volumes of um, food waste. In terms of the, uh, the way they recycle it, you're correct, absolutely, in saying that there's uh, an issue in terms of pressure on the uh, market volatility in terms of trying to get rid of um, and trying to uh, find the best use and best income from that um, from that recycling. I can tell you just now that um, if we were looking at the deposit recycling scheme being uh, introduced successfully, we would lose in terms of income £450,000 per year based on last year. So. You know, we do have we do have unique issues as well in Glasgow in terms of housing. We don't have, there's not any other local authority in Scotland that has the number of flats we've got. We are unable to provide the resourcing to the flats that we can for the curbside properties. And that presents really unique challenges. For example, if you live in a flat, you use a communal bin. There'll maybe be six two forty litre communal bins per close and two two hundred and forty litre recycling bins for dry mix recycle it, but there isn't any scope for glass bins. We've just recently introduced the food waste. Food waste is costing uh, the council between four or five million pounds a year just to introduce that new service. That's a major burden on the council. But why does it work in Helsinki and Greenock, but not in Glasgow? In terms of how does it in work? In terms of communal bins, in terms of recycling infrastructure. Well, that's a, that's, that's a, a really good question. Part of the reason goes back to behavioural change. We introduce this service, we do it in a well-meaning way, we do it and follow the obligations of the legislation, but we can't, we find it really difficult to get residents to take up the challenge of recycling. That's probably the biggest reason. Is it okay if I add something to that? Um, I think, um, Maurice, you, you mentioned funding. That funding was de minimis. So you had um, the whole argument where you had the collection in place, but the funding was going to run out. So. OK, in Falkirk, um, the, the, what we came to be able to afford that collection was to go for weekly residual um, residual waste. I don't think I need to tell anybody around the panel how politically sensitive that was at a local level. So um, certainly Falkirk felt <laughs> isolated and scrutinised when they made that decision. Um, so would I recommend a fellow local authority doing that? Tough. Um, this is what I'm saying. It was in, left an individual local authority to stand up and make that decision. That's very, very tough at a local political level. Um, so if it is truly serious, and again, I threw the question back um, to the committee, I'd throw it back. OK, tell us it's serious and commit to that, that that's the way to deliver things. And individually at a local level, that will make the implementation a lot easier. 
Thank you. So let's go back to the others responding to Mark's question. Yeah, if you can remember it. Yeah, yeah sorry, I was just I want, to be honest. And any other comments to yeah. my colleague's question as well? Not to, uh, uh, to some extent, have another go at Glasgow. It was just some of the, your comments, Tony, made uh, in terms of the challenges around the environmental uh, potential impact or disbenefit of the recycling. I just, just want to be clear that in, in almost all situations, recycling is better than landfill or disposal is, you know, even, I mean, it's not about the vehicles in the city or the vehicles that are collecting. The real impact is on how those materials are, are formed in the first place, the products that are formed and how they're, they're consumed in the home or in businesses and then ultimately how they're dealt with later on. The whole environmental impact of that is so significant that that's why recycling is so important. So I don't want, you know, there's, there's this idea that some myths still around there that, you know, recycling, driving your car to a local glass bank or something is causing more damage to the environment than recycling the glass itself. These are, these are just myths. You know, recycling is really important. Actually, prevention is even better. Uh, but we get into actually managing uh, the waste at the end of pipe. It is very much about recycling. Uh, but I do, I do uh, support colleagues to the left about this, because this, this, this is the real challenge. You know, the environmental uh, impacts of recycling, everybody knows it's the right thing to do. Everybody knows that. Uh, after waste prevention, that's what we should all be doing. But we do need to understand how can we afford to do that, and whether that's through the public purse or private sector or produce responsibility or whatever, or other mechanisms. That's what we need to really start to discuss. How do we afford the systems that we want to have here in Scotland and you know, going forward and to make sure they're flexible for all the other trends that we're going to be buffeted with in terms of materials and products? Uh, and it is an infrastructure opportunity, you know, and that's what the, the charter and the code of practice is really all about, is trying to align, uh, bring a bit of consistency to, to all intents and purposes, uh, as I call it, a, a resource grid in Scotland. We have materials, we need to bring a bit of consistency, we could, you know, in terms of through the pipe, through the collection infrastructure, so we can realise uh, many of the opportunities that are real for us here in Scotland in terms of processing these materials. And that is about taking on issues of quality and consistency of supply. And that's what the Charter is really all about, is working with local authorities to provide some degree of certainty of those materials into the marketplace. So not just so we can get a good price for them and our export potential, but more importantly, we can attract an inward investment or stimulate uh, Scottish companies to do more with those materials uh, because they have a bit of ownership of the supply. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge both in terms of working with individual authorities in terms of their budgets, uh, but it's also an opportunity at Scottish level to really start to understand what that infrastructure could look like into the future and how, you know, Tony's mentioned underground uh, containers and, and, you know, all sorts of infrastructure that's available. You can see it in other parts of uh, Europe and abroad. So it's that's the physicality of it as well. How do we want our materials uh, stewarded in the future, uh, the ones that are being used at business level or in consumer level or in households? How do we want to... To, to steward these materials back through so for the benefit of Scotland in, in terms of the physicality of it. So these are the big challenges, but that's all about us designing a system again around these opportunities that a circular economy brings to us, which are very visible now for us uh, in terms of the analysis that we've done on key sectors, key opportunities, key materials. And I think it's really about how do we work with local authorities on that uh, as, a, as a totality uh, to make sure we can re reap those benefits. <coughs> Um, I absolutely support what Ian is saying here in terms of um, the consistency and the quality as well as increasing the quantity here. It's CEPA is the environmental regulator. We see the problems much further downstream, but we recognise that addressing it upstream through um, interventions like the Household Recycling Charter, initiatives like the Household Recycling Charter, is, um, is what we need in terms of improving the quality and the consistency. For instance, at material recover, recovery facilities that we um, regulate, we're looking at the contamination levels in terms of what's going into them and out of them, and we're publishing a report on this in July in terms of the um, material quality. Also, our role in transfrontier shipment of waste. At the moment, the UK, Scotland, does not have a, reputa a good reputation in terms of the quality of the materials that it is sending abroad, and we are repatriating containers, and this is to the cost of the Scottish economy. So we're trying to work with brokers, shipping, and across the supply chain here, as well as up to um, the householders and the source segregation in terms of working with partners like Zero Waste Scotland and the local authorities to make sure that we're sending the highest quality abroad and we can improve our reputation in terms of the quality of materials that do go abroad as green list exports to be recycled and reprocessed. Mm -hmm. 
So um, in terms of households then, we've come from a low baseline, we're up to 44% now. My sense is from what you're saying this morning, a lot of that low hanging fruit is gone. Uh, we need to get up to 60% in the next five years. What's the one thing, what's the one change that's required to achieve that? Can we just go quickly through the panel? Um, I think part of the problem with the waste charter, in terms of, I'm supportive of the waste charter by the way, I hope it doesn't come across uh, the opposite of that, but part of the issue that local authorities have got is we've been working autonomously to try and bring some of these solutions forward. So uh, seven, eight years ago, we got into a strategic partnership to develop a residual waste treatment solution. So what we will be opening next year is a residual waste treatment solution. In simple terms, what that is, is the general waste bin, the waste that goes into that, which has got this rich recycler within it that has not been otherwise recycled, will be uh, segregated through um, a mechanical means. There'll be a smart uh, MRF, that's a material recycling facility. There'll be an anaerobic digester to deal with all organic material. And we'll be able to divert something like 80% what would normally have gone to landfill from that and improve a recycling by about 18% of the throughput from that. So part of the issue we've got is we're already committed to strategic partnerships for 25 years. These partnerships were put together before we started developing uh, waste charters. I do think there's, a, there's room for both and I think that, that it makes sense to do that. But we are committed towards providing a certain level of material, a certain type of composition to that project. Okay, so a large strategic MRF for dealing with residual waste. Other? Yeah. It's residual waste treatment. It's not just a MRF, it's an anaerobic digester. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Got um, that. Okay, other, to, other views? To answer your point, complete the circle of responsibility is a prime example. This is one, again, I've, I've, I've done it at a number of conferences, is everyone has a responsibility to play. Make, make it clear, make it cl the clarity on who is responsible at each stage. So the householder is responsible to use the services that they are provided. There's not a get out of jail free card. There's not a, if you really want to, please use it. But at the same time, manufacturers are understanding that they only produce products that can be um, recycled or reused. Um, the, the retailers understand their responsibility to communicate. I think we miss the, the onus. We all talk about communication. Um, the onus is, seems to be in all the local authorities to tell people, we don't sell the goods that people buy. Um, there's an opportunity for retailers to communicate to their customers that they have a responsibility um, to recycle it once they get. So complete that circle. Make sure everybody within that circle has a responsible. What, what, what's um, that actually, what does that actually mean? What does it actually look like if you're a householder? Is that a sanction? Is that so a tax? Or it, it, it can be what, one of two things. It, it, I think sanctions are very hard word. I don't think any of us would want to take somebody to court for putting a glass bottle in a, in a can. It's, it's to understand what your responsibility is, that you have to do it. So say, for example, okay, we empty residual waste every four weeks. If you don't recycle effectively, you're going to struggle. So there's a way to, to move things without it being a sanction as such. It's about what does sustainable waste collection services look like 2020 and beyond. Um, I think we get, sometimes we can get stuck in the here and now and not thinking about what, what does the future look like. But, but Tony makes a valid point, and, and, and Ian alluded to it as well. All these economic models are assuming participation. Um, food waste collection, if everybody uses it, makes economic sense. But 40 to 45 per cent of people only use it. Therefore, it doesn't make economic sense unless it's fully utilised. So the householder needs to understand what their responsibility is. But at the same time, a local authority or waste collector, because it may not be a local authority, a waste collector needs to understand their responsibility to provide consistent collections that allow for quality and quantity to be, de be delivered. So everybody has a role to play and everybody needs to clearly understand their role in contributing okay. to that. And then other views, top change in approach. So, I mean, it's, it's similar. I mean, <clears> it's about trying to, I mean, to some extent, not re-engage, but further engage with uh, both the citizen, I guess, and businesses around their obligations or their responsibilities uh, in terms of the bigger picture, in terms of climate change, in terms of the opportunities from a circular economy, which maybe is the local message that people don't don't really uh, don't hear. They, they don't really understand. They're still a lot of uncertainty from the, the public about what happens to the stuff that they put out for, for recycling, where does it go? I mean, uh, and, you know, so it's getting that message out, really engaging with people. So that, that and that's a big uh, exercise, uh, both at local level and at national level, and that obviously takes resources. So I guess it is about that whole thing about, we really need to understand how do we invest in this? How do we invest in what we've got? Because a lot of the answers are, are, 
are still technically feasible with the infrastructure we've got. You know, it's not, you, you look to other countries, Wales, for instance, you know, they've got higher recycling rates, basically doing the same as what local authorities are doing uh, technically as, as the ones that we're, we've got represented here uh, and the same. So it's not, so we can get there, but we need to invest in it. We need to invest in the running costs of that uh, continually. We need to innovate. We need to look at different ways of collecting, different ways of engaging with the citizen. And obviously there's a key role for us as Zero Waste Scotland and with other partners. But it's how do we work? How do we support the local authorities? And the challenge is, as, as Robin says, who else is coming to the table with, with support, both financially or through their own channels, uh, whether that's mm -hmm. producers or not? It's understanding everybody has a role in this and everybody should have that ambition to get behind this mm -hmm. and support it, because this is an infrastructure. This is an infrastructure for Scotland, for Scotland's economic, social and environmental benefit. And we should all see that investing in it and continuing to invest in it and innovating around it is, is a responsibility we all have but also it really does show leadership both okay. in terms of Scotland but across the globe. Okay, and Rebecca Walker. Um, partnership working here is so so important um, in terms of being able to deliver these economic and environmental and societal benefits. I think we really need to understand where an intervention's brought in or a system's brought in at one point, the knock-on impact it has on the other parts of the supply chain. And it is by working together that we can get all the right tools, the right interventions and the levers in the right place to understand this, to maximise the value we get from our materials and resources. Right. OK. Um, so just before we, we continue, because I know we've got another, some other questions, we've got two brief supplementaries from Claudia Beamish and uh, Finlay Carson. Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, it's to ask the panel to go back to the point that was raised earlier about the... Um, the exception of householders in the regulations and uh, whether, in your view, um, they need to be revisited. Finley <coughs> Carson as well, so you can answer the questions at the same time. Uh, the, my, mine was relating to the, the, the new type of plant you're talking about to better separate um, from, a, from the main bin. Does that not send out the wrong message that actually we're not going to change the culture of how people behave and, 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 and moving away from the emphasis on curbside recycling back to everybody can throw whatever they like in a bin together and the, the council will sort it out. Okay. Uh, quite possibly that might be a message that's construed from that. Um, I think the, the issue, as I go back to again, was local authorities, as Robin uh, points out, are left holding the baby here in, try, in terms of trying to de deliver sincerely the recycling targets. We've got to um, introduce, we do have the issue where we don't have the infrastructure to support something like, say, Falkirk has been able to, to do. Um, so we've, we're left with the challenge of how do we get the recycle it and how do we move that forward. Even when we introduce food waste specific to each address in the city, we will find that 30% of the general waste that's in the general waste bin is food. Um, so what, I think we've got to be, I suppose, pragmatic and realistic about what we can actually um, Provide and there's got to be a, certainly there's been a kind of approach taken where we understand we'll always strive to have bespoke and individual recycling services, but there will always be an element that will end up in that general waste bin. And I suppose what we're trying to do is, is to is, is do both things. In terms of the the question about the regulations, uh, I think really interesting question that, and I think that absolutely there has to be some revisiting of that. Unfortunately, I don't know what the solution is because I don't know how we actually impose that. I don't know what the big stick is, but there has to be something that compels residents to do more than what they're doing, and that will get rid and, uh, and rid of all these these issues longer term. But the problem we've had as a local authority, using Glasgow as an example, is we've not been able to wait. We didn't know a waste charter was coming in eight years' time. We were trying to sincerely meet our obligations as a council, and I think Robin's point is really well made. Probably the mistake that's made continuously is it falls on the council to be big brother. And there has to be more done in terms of the universality of responsibility from the producer to the resident. And certainly the local authority have got a role in there as well, but they're not the, they, they seem to be the, the kind of fall guy, if you will, for all the problems. You know, but we try and introduce the reduced frequencies for the right reasons. It's the council's fault. Um, we try to run on a, a meagre budget at times. There has to be investment in this, but there are, primarily we should look at the regulations. Unfortunately, I can't advise on what measure you could take, what sanction you could take that would be either meaningful or fair. 
Like since I rant about the regulations more than anyone, um, it's probably good that um, I answer that question. Absolutely, without question. The analogy I give is the smoking ban um, that the Scottish Government um, did. If we had a regulation around the smor smoking ban that said, please, can you not smoke in a restaurant? What would have happened? Would we have had the significant impact and the significant change that we see now where we all can go out to a pub or a club without coming home smelling of, of smoke? It's the same. This is behaviour change. It's no different. So again, we have to see uh, if we are serious and we are serious of our environmental credentials, we need to then turn around and say, this isn't a, a voluntary request. You're not doing the council's job for them by recycling, which I hear five times a week, and I'm sure Tony hears it too. No, you're doing your job because it's your responsibility to how you manage your waste in which the council will support you to make the right decision. So absolutely. Okay. Mark Roscoe. Um, I could just move on to organic waste, garden waste, food waste. Um, you, you've mentioned um, some of the challenges around collection already, but I was wondering if there's anything more that you want to add uh, around this topic, around what the opportunities might be. I mean, my sense is that we're seeing an evolving model of food waste collection, but also quite a few local authorities rolling back on garden waste collection. Um, whether you see home composting as, as part of the solution here or What's what's the optimum mix? I mean, that, um, start with Ian Gullen maybe on this one, and then uh, maybe okay. move. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, certainly as you've said, I mean, the food uh, food collection uh, infrastructure is now very much in play in Scotland. What was the, the aim? About I think over eighty percent of households are now access to it, and that was the, the plan. Obviously, there's a uh, rural parts of Scotland are exempt. Uh, so that's about 1.9 million people have access to it. So you're now seeing, I mean, some of those systems are only just bedding in, uh, as Tony's mentioned, in terms of Glasgow. Uh, so food waste collections are increasing. Uh, and obviously, like any of the systems that are in play, you know, work has to be done on participation rates. It's not just about rolling out uh, a service or introducing a box or a bin or a caddy to householders. It's like actually getting them to use it on a regular basis, so a lot more work has to be done there, I recognise that. Uh, obviously from uh, commercial, the, the regulations in terms of food waste have, have kicked in, uh, and whilst I think there's a lot more participation in larger businesses, there's probably still some work to be done on some of the smaller uh, food premises uh, in the high street, so to speak, and maybe Rebecca will want to talk about that. Uh, but things are in generally that direction, but it is still about engaging with people about the importance of that kitchen caddy, I think, as Robin said, I mean, it is an engagement opportunity because people, I think, generally want to want to do the right thing. You know, they're, they're given a suite of bins and it is about communication. People generally want to do the right thing, both for the environment, both for the local economy, and there's obviously some social opportunities as well for them. So I think you're beginning to see an acceptance around food waste, which is a very positive thing. It's actually an engagement with the people, individuals, on the importance of food waste. And we're now seeing that, you know, you've seen it on television. In fact, you know, we've had debates in Parliament on I mean, food waste and, and the, the, real, the real challenge of reducing food waste. And obviously we have a target here in Scotland, 33%. And that's the real challenge. So there is a, there is a bit of a, I wouldn't say a tension, but we're actually trying to now, once we've introduced a food waste caddy to households in Scotland, we're now actually trying to reduce this. The, the usage of it, not in terms of the participation rates, but the amount of stuff that possibly was going into it when they were first introduced, which is very unusual to all the recycling systems which councils have introduced, where they've actually tried to maximise the amount of material that somebody's tried to put into it. Uh, we're now seeing, the, technically, they're actively going out trying to reduce food waste. And that's possibly a, one of the challenges going forward in terms of the amount of food waste that's available to councils uh, even working with ourselves and what was potentially going to be uh, you, was going to come out of the household is possibly less because actually we are now seeing or beginning to see a reduction in actual food waste both in household levels and in the commercial, uh, which is all good is all good for these individual businesses and good for the economy in terms of uh, not just environmental savings but cost savings. Uh, the issue about garden waste is, is yeah, it's, it's something that uh, obviously a lot of councils have introduced. Uh, initially, uh, and obviously there's no obligation uh, for them to provide a garden waste collection, so some of them obviously have decided to, to either introduce a charge for that uh, to residents or to reduce the actual 
uh, availability of it, uh, providing, going back to providing increased capacity at civic community sites or household recycling centres. We've seen some encouraging uh, home composting again. So uh, these are solutions. These are solutions. But again, it's about engaging with the householder uh, and the communities, I guess, on what those solutions are best placed for those particular situations. Rebecca Walker, do you have a um, Yeah, in terms of food waste focus on the commercial side here, given our regulatory role, so we've seen um, a huge um, increase in the food waste, waste segregated due to the Waste Scotland regulations. Um, over the last year, we've used our new enforcement um, powers in terms of the fixed monetary penalty as a campaign to tackle those um, waste producers that have responsibilities to, with the duty to recycle. Um, we tackled 73 persistent, um, persistent offenders in terms of their compliance. And just the myth, um, threat of the fixed monetary penalty changed behavior here. And we issued um, two fixed monetary penalties um, during this campaign. And we have seen a change in their behavior as well. So we are seeing across Scotland an increase in the food waste from um, food waste businesses. We also, in terms of the second largest com commercial and industrial source of waste, it is food and waste, um, food and drink manufacturing. And I think it's really important to make sure that while we collect and take this waste in terms of for recycling, we need to have the right infrastructure in place here as well. So we're working with industry and Zero Waste Scotland to ensure that we can get the maximum value from all this organic waste in terms of keeping that circular economy, um, in terms of keeping it out of landfill and um, used for soil restoration and agricultural benefit as well. To infrastructure later on. Yep. Can I just go? Sorry, my, my, my mistake. Apologies. I just wanted to get Ian Gullen to comment on my question previously about revisiting the regulations, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. Apologies. I think that, 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 uh, Ian touched upon it. Um, garden waste collections are the only non statutory service uh, collection that the Council um, provide, and under the controlled waste regulations, are um, within their right to apply a charge for the collection of that, which is quite well established down south. Um, so I think it has to be seen that that service um, is a severe risk across the 32 local authorities in Scotland, either to stop or be chargeable within the next 18 months to two years. Um, of that, there's no, no question. Um, it can't be. The telling, the telling stat I always have with food waste is um, when Falkirk Council operated a residual waste collection every fortnight, we collected 0 0.6 kilograms per household. When we moved to a three-weekly residual waste collection, we collected 1.2 kilograms of food waste um, per week. Um, when we moved to a four-weekly residual waste collection, we, we, we are just under 1.6 kilograms of food waste captured per week. The leaflet was exactly the same. So what changed the behaviour? It wasn't the communications. It wasn't saying that I came up with a great communication method or a great tool or a great leaflet or a great interactive app. There was only one thing that changed that made that behaviour shift across. And that was going from the two weekly to the four weekly. And the data is quite clear on that. So again, when, we're, when you're looking at it, people kind of know what they what need to do, but don't necessarily do it. Claudia, we should uh, point to Ian Gullen be answered there. Please, yeah, so that was the, would, should we, review the regulations in terms of the ex-householder. Yes. The uh, exemption. I, know, I, mean, I mean, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd slightly struggle with it because I'm trying to try and imagine what that would actually look like in practice if you did change that uh, and how that would be, I guess, enforced to some extent. Uh, but the other part of me, I guess, the, probably more of a personal thing. I'm more of a, a believer in the carrot first before the stick. I still think, with every respect, we haven't really you know, there's probably more efforts we could make with the individual uh, at household level or the citizen and the communities around their responsibility or potential uh, responsibilities, voluntary responsibilities around climate change, uh, or certainly in terms of recycling and waste prevention uh, and taking these messages out. I get the points that, that Robin's making, but I still think there's a lot more that we could be doing and encouraging uh, participation rates, uh, both at community level uh, and otherwise, and, and almost, I wouldn't say repeating the same narrative, but changing the narrative slightly around all of the opportunities, both at local level in terms of jobs uh, and social benefits around what we're trying to achieve. I think it's 
it's a missed opportunity because our own narrative has changed from just simply trying to recycle uh, because we need to get stuff out of landfill to, you know, it's the right thing for the environment, but actually now it's, it's the right thing both for the environment, the local economy, uh, and, you know, tackling some uh, social injustices. So I think there is a real opportunity to re-engage with people. People like to know what's happening to the materials, why they're getting involved. Uh, so I think that's probably my first response is probably there's more we could do rather than simply see legislation. But that's very optimistic and I, and I don't I to, Sorry. detract from that at all. But why should householders be the only ones in the whole chain who don't have that responsibility put onto them in a statutory way? Can I add something? Sorry, to, to your point. <coughs> Rebecca mentioned earlier that the, the threat of the notice to the businesses was a huge impact. Mm. We don't have that threat. Um, and so why are businesses yeah. not afforded the same opportunity to get on board? Um, but we will serve a notice in a business. So if you run your own business, we'll serve a notice of you. You go to the householder, we'll send you an officer round, which we are, don't have many of anymore, Tony, <laughs> to say please. Um, so my argument is the same as you, 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 you reiterated. The threat of that on the business was quite a force to do that. Um, so are we overthinking this, that sometimes the threat that we could do something, we did it down south with the Clean Neighbourhood Act, where the local authorities do have the ability to serve um, a penalty on householders. We're not saying we'll do it. You have to do it in terms of you have to engage with the householder. If you demonstrate um, there's one householder, there's one area, I have sent um, an officer nine times um, to publicly engage, to do individual meetings, to do individual group meetings, that still doesn't have an impact. How many times is enough? Is the question. And if it's effective on businesses, just that threat, why? Why would we not do that to householders? Mark. Um, thanks, Kavina. Can I finally move on to packaging? Can I specifically ask Ian Garland and Rebecca Walker about where you see the greatest opportunities are to reduce packaging waste? What kind of initiatives are already underway uh, in, in relation to producer responsibility uh, to try and get a grip of this? Um, CEPA administers for producer responsibility compliance schemes, packaging being one of these regimes. In 2015 alone, we saw 7.4 million tonnes of packaging financed by the producers in terms of recycling and taken out the waste stream, and this covered paper, aluminium, steel, um, and other types of packaging. So in terms of what the packaging regs have already achieved, we should, it is a celebration. I think this is a success, but there's always room for improvement. So we could be doing a lot more to look at this, to work with other UK administrations in terms of achieving more through the packaging regs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, quite a lot has been done on package, particularly food waste, uh, not food waste packaging, but food packaging. Uh, and a lot of it is actually, with every respect, sort of probably under the radar. Uh, so we've worked, obviously, from Scotland with, uh, with UK colleagues uh, through the Waste and Resources Action Programme, through a commitment with the main retailers uh, called the Corto Commitment, which really did focus on reducing packaging. Uh, and a lot of work has been done in terms of the numbers, uh, and that's really been done through light weighting of packaging and changing of formats, which it's probably not easily recognisable when you're walking up and down the supermarkets uh, at home. And I, and I know that even from my own point of view, but uh, a lot has been done by the industry and that's been driven by a commitment to reduce packaging, a voluntary commitment uh, across all the sectors, uh, the main players, but also you know, recognition that there's a business case for this in terms of the volumes that they truck around the country and, and light weighting, obviously, in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, so there has been quite a considerable amount done uh, but that's not to say more needs to be done. And I guess I would, from my conversations, that most of these retailers and producers are very focused on their packaging. Uh, but more importantly, they're trying to understand how they can get reduce the carbon footprint of packaging even greater. And they're very much focused on the recycled content of that, because that's the biggest way that they can reduce the, the global footprint or the, the uh, carbon footprint of the materials. And that means, again, coming back to the point about infrastructure, where does that material come from? How can they access clean, good quality plastic flake or glass 
uh, or card uh, to introduce recycled fibres or, or material into their packaging to get that back onto the shelf and also then the recyclability of it, making it available for recycling. So the recycling systems are available, the will is there from packaging, uh, producers, etc. But the real challenge is how do we get we can set targets, we should have 30% recycled content or 50%, and these are you know, already considered, and a lot of the industry is, is suggesting those targets themselves. But actually accessing the quality of materials to put that in to their products is a real challenge at the moment. And that, to some extent, that's how the infrastructure needs to be joined up. How do we then, in Scotland, supply that raw material into those industries who are actually looking for it? There's a demand. I mean, the, the yeah. clear one we have in Scotland is the whisky industry. That's the, one of their biggest challenges now, to reduce uh, the, the carbon footprint of their, of their packaging glass. Uh, how do they source good quality flint primarily, uh, in terms of clear glass, uh, and to reduce the carbon impact of their, their glass bottles? They've done a lot of work on light weighting. We've worked with them significantly over the last couple of years. The, a lot of the main bottles are a lot lighter than they were in the past. Uh, that's technically feasible. Uh, it's technically feasible to get more glass, uh, recycled glass into that. But that's one of the real challenges now, is how do they source that glass uh, from a local base, uh, particularly in Scotland, where the glass, the glass bottle manufacturing uh, is primarily based for the whisky industry. So that's, that's one of okay. the challenges, I think, going forward, that we really need to try and join up uh, our infrastructure and the quality and the supply of those to those people who are already making those decisions that they want to drive the recycled content up. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Morris Gordon. Thanks, Convener. Uh, the next section is on waste uh, treatment infrastructure, and I'll direct my questions to uh, Ian Gulland and Rebecca Walker in the first instance. However, if the local authorities would like to chip in, just, just flag. Um, there's four areas we'd like to cover in a quite snappy fashion. Uh, first of all, just generally looking at infrastructure, then looking specifically around incineration, thereafter exports, and finally closing off with some particular materials and the opportunities around that. So first of all, uh, in your opinion, uh, Ian Gullen, do we have sufficient infrastructure to meet Scottish Government targets? Uh, so the, the simple answer is, to some extent, yes, because there is infrastructure available. And if we are talking about uh, energy from waste, I guess, there is also uh, an opportunity to export materials. So there is an oversupply of uh, material for energy from waste going forward, then there are markets overseas, uh, in, particularly in uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, and that is an opportunity, uh, because I guess the real challenge is, is we've talked about the trends in terms of waste, waste composition, uh, both in terms of volume and quality. You know, what is the infrastructure that we require both at, immediately uh, and going forward? I mean, Tony's already talked about his 25-year uh, commitment in terms of Glasgow. So those facilities that you're talking about our long-term facilities. So this is about, do we want capacity that fits our future needs or our immediate needs, bearing in mind all of the things we've just talked about mm. in terms of the, we, what we're actually trying to achieve here in Scotland. So I guess in terms of the targets, uh, yes, there is, uh, there is facilities available. Uh, you, could, you could argue, well, we want to do more with that waste material in Scotland. So that would still need uh, more infrastructure to be developed uh, over the next sort of five years. But again, if that ties us then into 25 years uh, beyond that, so that's a 30-year kind of horizon, then <coughs> is that really what we're trying to do? So I think the real trick at the moment is to really think about what's the infrastructure we need in the future and not tie us into something which is going to, A, limit our recycling ambitions and, and also, uh, if I may ask, and I've said this before in this chamber, uh, really become an outrider in terms of our low carbon ambitions. I mean, with every respect, incineration uh, in terms of uh, CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour is still, it's still very high. And it's higher at the moment than the Scottish average uh, kilowatt hour uh, grams, uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour in, in terms of the fact that we're shifting towards renewables. So going forward, the more of those plants we have in Scotland, the more outriders we're going to have, the more long annex we're going to have of the future in terms of energy from waste. So that's something I think, you know, from an energy point of view or a low carbon point of view in terms of the Scottish position, we need to really consider, you know, that those are not long term, well, they could cause us longer term uh, issues going forward. 
So I, I guess that's the simple answer, said in a long-winded answer. So, and just just to kind of push you a little bit further on that, the, the current estimates from the Scottish Government is that incineration capacity is going to go up 12 and a half times over the next five years. And as you've pointed out, that actually ties Scotland in for up to 30 years. So how does that reflect on the target for a recycling rate of 70%? For example, in 2025. Well, I, I mean, at the moment, it's, it's not. Uh, I mean, I guess we're focused on the recycling rate to get as much of that material out, high value material. Uh, that's what the systems and uh, that are being put in play in the public sector and the commercial sector. So, I guess the question is, hitting the 70% target, does that leave enough material to be uh, fed to the incineration capacity? Going back to the point, if we see more increased waste prevention of that, I guess these are the numbers, and that is something that is modelled on a regular basis between ourselves and SEPA uh, and others uh, in terms of the, the government uh, analysis as well to try and understand what does that final picture, or not even the final picture, how does mm -hmm. that picture evolve over not just the next five years but beyond that. Okay. And can you outline what that is? I mean, is, is it right that, you know, that Scotland should be increasing incineration capacity by 12 and a half times over the next five years, or should we be focusing on exports of that waste because that provides flexibility for Scotland and indeed the councils going forward and ultimately would allow uh, an ability to meet targets and uh, move uh, in a faster manner. I say this because when I talk to colleagues in Europe, they say to me, learn from our mistakes, don't build incineration yeah. capacity, because then you'll struggle to fill it in 10, 20, 30 years' time. Yeah. I'm going to try and ask Rebecca in terms of the numbers, because you've done 12 and a half percent. I mean, my understanding... 12 and a half times. 12 and a half times. But that's from a very low point. So it's about the actual number. Mm -hmm. How does it relate to the actual material that's available? I'd be happy to come in on the numbers here. In construction, we have four energy from waste facilities totaling around 945,000 tonnes, so just under a million tonnes. In terms of meeting the targets, if we were looking into the capacity in Scotland, we'd be looking at one point, just over 1.5 million tonnes. So at the moment, we're at very, very low risk of overcapacity in terms of what is in construction. And that gives us the flexibility that Ian mentioned in terms of what is going abroad. So we, at the moment, send 200,000 tonnes of RDF abroad um, to those that have capacity um, in terms of energy from waste facilities. And this gives us the flexibility like you say, um, we're not locking ourselves into an overcapacity here, and there's very low risk at the moment of that. And as Ian also mentioned, we do model this quite regularly, Zero Waste Scotland, SEPA, and Scottish Government, in terms of the infrastructure we need in the future, because it's not just what we need now, it's what we need in 30 years' time, it's what we need in 40 years' time that we need to be thinking about. Richard Lyle, I think got a supplementary on this. Yeah, uh, supplementary on, um, you say there's four sites, incinerators, where are they? And we, we speak, we seem to speak flippantly about incinerators. We have people who are very concerned about incinerators being built right beside them. So what would you say to those people who, you know, 50 years ago we, we burned our, our rubbish and were fire, but nowadays we want to burn an incinerator and we want to build them 200 yards away from houses? in particular in Whitehill and Hamilton. Why would we want to do that? Um, in terms of, um, I appreciate your question, in terms of the regulations, compared to decades ago, we're in a very different world. We um, regulate um, incinerators to very, very strict emission limits. And we also look at the energy that is recovered from them efficiently. So in terms of the regulations, they are there very, very strict emission limits. So why, people, why do people not believe you? In terms of the public perception of incinerators, we are looking at a historical legacy. Um, Sorry, I'll, I'll just be brief. I agree, and, and I'll go back to a, a, an organisation I used to deal with, APSI. I was a councillor for years. I agree with the, that um, things are getting better, but how do we, what do we say to people? Uh, we want to incinerate, but we want to build this plant right next door to you. Should we not? Where are these other four sites you're talking about? We have um, two sites near Edinburgh. We have one in Edinburgh at Miller Hill, one at Dunbar, 
a site in Glasgow and a site in Leamancy. So if there's a site in Glasgow, why do we need to build one in Erdingston and Bell Sill? At that point, just to give you a, try and answer the question, we don't recognise uh, the term incineration, it's gasification, and that, that will partly, I'm not trying to be clever, I'm trying to answer your question, and because you asked a really pertinent question about the difference between household waste. The way that that um, the stuff that used to be burnt in the fire, the way that that waste is controlled now is 21st century. In terms of how that, we will have a residual waste treatment solution, uh, which will look at 200, we'll cap it, we've capped it specifically for Glasgow's waste at 200,000 tonnes. Done that for a reason. One of the reasons is it can't be the be all and end all for the waste. We've got to challenge ourselves continuously for recycling. So we'd mentioned earlier on, we produced anything between, in the last year, 265,000 tonnes to 10 years ago, 350,000 tonnes of waste. We built in a legacy for the future to try and challenge ourselves continuously in terms of recycling. The material that goes through uh, the residual waste treatment plant, it's known as the Glasgow Recycling and Renewable Energy Centre, will smart remove all the material that can be removed in terms of dry mix recycling. Organic material will go through uh, anaerobic digestion, then as a last port of call, it'll go through a gasification process and there's a whole range of chemical processes that, to be honest with you, are beyond me. But what they do is strictly monitor how that stuff goes into the atmosphere. Uh, the noxious substances and what have you are strictly controlled. And that's a key part of the package coming in for Glasgow. But I know that Mr Carson had asked the question about, is it not diametrically opposed in terms of you're trying to introduce uh, these, uh, this solution, but surely should be trying to do more with the, the wheel bins. What we're trying to do is build for the future, but have a, a balance that ensures we try and maximise as much as possible from recycle to try and avoid that one-stop shop at the end. Very, very briefly, gentlemen, because we're really up yeah, against it time-wise. The, the question I'd want to go back to is obviously, Maurice, your point. You need to be very careful with export. <laughs> Exports factored on the pound's performance against the euro or the dollar. Um, you know, after after Brexit was announced, uh, the cost of export increased by 23% um, based on the pound coming down. There's a reason our Scandinavian countries see the benefit of, yes, they have done over capacity slightly, but they understand the heat generation and um, benefit that can come with um, energy from waste facilities, and in some cases they're right in city centres uh, and in town centres to, to heat that town centre and uh, city centre. So we need to be very careful when we're if we're relying on export. Two reasons. The rest of Europe know we've got a biodegradable ban in 2021. If we get to that stage and we don't have enough capacity, they're going to hold us to ransom because they know we can't landfill it and we know we've got to export it. So let, let's be very careful and let's make a clear distinction between planned consent and actual um, and actual infrastructure. There's two clear distinctions there. We might, ha we might have a perception that the planned consent is over capacity, but how many of them will actually hit the ground come 2021 when we actually can't do anything else and we're being held to ransom by our European neighbours? Ian Gollan, very briefly. Yeah, I know, I know. But I did, I'll counter that argument because at the end of the day, quite a lot of the facilities in Europe are crying out for waste. So I hear your point about held to ransom, but they are yeah. actually... You know, it's a cutthroat business in mainland Europe to try and get hold of waste from around Europe, the uh, eastern part of Europe, as well as ourselves here. There's also an export market more broadly down south as well, where there is very much concerns that there will be overcapacity uh, further south in terms of materials. So I don't think that kind of ransom issue is, is, is as real and present as you say, Robin. Sorry. Uh, but I do think, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan. In fact, I, I've, I've, been, I've been in this chamber in a previous role uh, giving evidence around incineration, uh, so there is, you know, in all the aspects of, you know, locking up materials that could really stimulate investment and economic opportunities for Scotland. So there's some real and present issues there that need to be addressed. But I guess, I, as I say to everybody, it is about how you engage with communities around this. If you are going to have it, how do you how do you engage, and how do you start to understand that this, there's a strategy here? You know, whether it's, I mean. We, the reason some of them are in cities are about district heating systems, and there's a very successful one in Shetland uh, that provides uh, heat and power to the hospital, etc. And that's how, you know, the, the, the good cases are point in other European countries where they've gone to communities and said, how would you like, with every respect, uh, renewable heat or, or uh, a heat, district heating system that allows you access at ch cheaper rates? in terms of power and to local businesses as well. And that's more of a selling point, I guess. And it's not about the pollution. It's not trying to sell something that's going to, you know, to some extent, impact on their health because, as 
Uh, Rebecca says that the monitoring of incinerators is, is far in excess of how it used to be. Uh, but having said all that, you know, there is a, there is a, is a longer term issue around Scotland looking at this strategically, looking at what do we actually need now and to some extent what does that infrastructure look like now and how can we, to whatever respect, how can we wean ourselves off it if we have too much of it over going forward? Because as I said, we'll lock it, we'll lock it in, we'll miss opportunities around the circular economy in terms of recycling and job creation potentially here in Scotland, but more importantly, we'll start to really impact on our ambitions around climate change. Okay. I think it would be really helpful if uh, Zero Waste Scotland, and perhaps in conjunction with SEPA, wrote to the committee outlining some of those points which he articulated regarding the future infrastructure uh, map for Scotland. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of uh, particular materials, particularly uh, food waste, and according to SEPA's waste uh, uh, data analysis, about one million tonnes of food waste is currently not being captured. Uh, and processed. So with respect to that, how are we um, uh, going to cope with the landfill ban that's uh, coming in in 2021? In terms of the landfill ban, we're working with Zero Waste Scotland, Scottish Government and industry to develop guidance in preparation for the ban, and that will be in conjunction with looking at the future infrastructure that we have. So this is going to be all the biodegradable municipal waste, the black bag waste that's going to have, that's going to be banned from landfill from the 1st of January 2021. Um, but do we have enough infrastructure? Because no, obviously it's a very short, it's January the 1st, 2021. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would suggest unless we've got the infrastructure either there now or, or being available, then it could be an issue. But with the energy from waste plants in construction and the option to... So we'd be burning... Food waste. It's biodegradable municipal waste, so it's all black bag waste from um, from um, local authorities. But we have that focus on reducing the residual waste and pulling out the food waste. So we have other tools in terms of the local authorities' household collections, the Waste Scotland regulations in terms of segregating food waste there, if it is biodegradable municipal waste coming from them. Um, so it's in terms of segregating that waste first, we're always going to focus on the recycling of the food waste, reducing the food waste and the dry recyclates before sending any residual waste um, to landfill and from 2021 to energy from waste. Okay. What about in rural areas where there's currently an exemption on um, separate collections of, of food waste? Do you see more of a challenge there or indeed an opportunity to build particular uh, infrastructure in rural or in island communities? Um, or Mr. Gulland, places like Orkney, for example. Yeah, I wonder if you're, if you're thinking again about energy from waste. I mean, it goes point to. No, no, it goes like anaerobic. Well, yeah, anaerobic. I mean, it does go back to, uh, sorry, the point that uh, Mark Ruskell raised about you know, the future infrastructure. Uh, I mean, particularly around garden waste, of, you know, one of the challenges, uh, again, in a previous role, there was a lot of community composting initiatives. Uh, around Scotland, and then when council started to take in garden waste as a, as a collection infrastructure, it basically took away the feedstock from a number of uh, community, uh, geographical communities. Some of them were, were uh, in the rural parts of Scotland. So you could understand there's a reversal here, a potential reversal, where councils work more collaboratively, collaboratively with communities and others to bring in other solutions, uh, both for garden waste and food waste. And absolutely, I, you know, I still believe that's that's the case in the rural parts of Scotland. In terms of technology, we're seeing a lot of uh, micro technology now. That's, that's the big thing, both in terms of AD and food waste uh, operations, food waste processing. Those are uh, opportunities for, for rural parts of Scotland, I think, having, you know, in terms of uh, whether that's run by a local authority or whether that's run by a community or another provider, very much aligned to some of the renewable uh, companies that are out there working. So absolutely, and I think that's something that we've been looking at is what does that technology look like and how could it be applied? What's the perfect fit? Uh, okay. But I know we've done, you can be aware yourself, Morris worked in Orkney uh, for a number of years looking at some real real solutions for them in terms of their, their food waste or their certainly organic uh, material, not just from the householder, but looking across the two distilleries, the cheese. Mm and the milk uh, producers as well. So I, absolutely, I think there's a fantastic interest in that now where there wasn't before, because mm. it is about almost disaggregating that resource grid I was talking about in terms of trying to centralise that through 
the public sort of system. It's how can local communities and local opportunities arise, and we've seen a lot of that interest now in the rural parts of Scotland. Okay. Uh, final question. Um, if there was one piece of uh, waste treatment infrastructure you could put in Scotland, and you're not allowed to say an incinerator, um, what would that be? So I'm thinking, you know, something to do with mattress, plastic recycling, carpets, tyres. What would that be, very briefly? Something that could solve our tyre um, problem would be great. Okay. So I I mean, I could pick one. Uh, plastic is an obvious one, but actually, I think it's the whole thing. I think in terms of the circular economy, we should be thinking about landing all of that as a package. So we should understand we have a tyres issue or a tyres opportunity, we have a plastics opportunity, we have a mattress opportunity, we have a carpet opportunity, and it's how we actually... This is an infrastructure. So instead of trying to just pick things and try and hope that they'll actually land in Scotland, we now have enough data, and enough opportunity, enough recognition of what these circular economy opportunities are for Scotland. It might not just be one of each thing, talked about their rural opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think this, we've, we can now start to coalesce around a package of infrastructure that would really make Scotland start to drive the circular economy forward in terms of the input materials and the export, no, sorry, the output materials for our own economy. That is a real and present op opportunity now for Scotland and we're still just picking at things and saying let's solve this, solve that. That's what we know here at Zero Waste Scotland and working with partners. There are real opportunities now to make that happen but it has to be done at a strategic level. Right, so we actually start to realise that. It's not down to, with every respect, local authority level. It's done at a Scotland level to realise those ambitions. OK, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, Angus MacDonald. Thanks, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. If I could turn to the issue of compliance and enforcement. Um, I'm keen to explore fixed penalty notices and, and other enforcement measures, but to start with, uh, I'd like to focus on business compliance rates. Um, which Rebecca Walker has uh, already referred to in response to an earlier uh, question. So, with regard to the requirement for businesses to present key recyclables separately for collection, uh, as required by the Waste Scotland um, Regulations 2012, what are the business compliance rates? Uh, and similarly, just for the record, uh, what are the compliance rates of food businesses presenting waste food separately for collection as per the Waste Scotland Regulations? Thank you. We've carried out um, over 7,000 inspections in partnership with local authorities across businesses in all parts of Scotland. 80% um, of these, we're seeing a, com a compliance rate of 80% of these carrying out some recycling in terms of their dry recycling and their food waste based on what type of business there is and where their focus should be in terms of what they're separating out. As I mentioned before, we've seen we have information from service providers and local authorities and those that are persistently non-compliant, and we do tackle these and focus our efforts in tackling these. And we've seen a great change in terms of the fixed monetary penalty threat. So um, we saw about an 88% change and then over 90% once we issued two, um, two fixed monetary penalties here. So we are seeing a high, high compliance here. Um, I think we can carry on in terms of the campaign we do here, the access to information of some businesses. We work very closely with Zero Waste Scotland on the communications. Sometimes it's awareness and understanding, and sometimes it's persistent non-compliant, and we need to know when to use the right intervention and the right tool to change behaviour here. And we do have a process to go through in terms of tackling compliance. Okay, thanks. You, you certainly mentioned in, in your submission uh, to the committee that the fixed monetary pen penalties are powerful tools um, to, to increase compliance, um, and the, the figures would, would certainly suggest that. Um, moving on, I have I've some, uh, some issues in my constituency regarding non-compliance, um, uh, perhaps bordering on, on uh, waste crime. Um, I'm curious as to what are the biggest challenges uh, relating to tackling waste crime in, in Scotland, and uh, uh, also extended non-compliance, which, which seems to be a, a, an issue at times uh, around the country? Um, waste, waste crime is very difficult to measure. It's a huge problem. It's because it's such a hidden issue. Um, it's difficult in terms of reporting on it, detecting it. A recent report, Rethinking Waste Crime, highlighted that it costs the UK economy £600 million per year. So we take it very seriously. SEPA treat it as a complete priority. We're working with industry and partners at an international, national and local level. 
We recently came at, um, we recently undertook a perception study where we had 257 respondents, and this is due to be published um, in July. Some of the key messages from this was that crime is endemic, and that we do need to do more to, um, in terms of being more visible, visible to do this. So CEPA should be running like education awareness campaigns around this, and CEPA should be more visible in terms of what it is doing to tackle race crime, since we do treat it as a priority. But at the same time, the respondents also highlighted that reducing it within the industry is definitely possible. It is, tackling it is so important because we do need that level playing field as well as protecting the environment and it, getting the maximum value from resources. We need that level playing field for legitimate businesses to thrive. So I completely appreciate that waste crime is an issue and it needs to be tackled and we are treating it as a priority. Okay, thanks. And can I ask the, the, the panel in, in general what their views are on the, the enforcement and compliance tools that, uh, that are available to, to SEPA uh, and how effective they are, um, for example, uh, issuing final warning notices or um, referring cases to the Procurator Fiscal? Yep. Um, thanks. I'm kind of happy to answer that. I said I think SEPA have the tool and have the will to use that tool. Um, and sometimes is um, environmental crime taken as seriously as it needs to be when it goes forward to the courts would be um, a question that I would certainly um, put to that. You know, that I certainly have worked closely within my local authority area with SEPA to deal with issues of um, sort of businesses that were causing us concern. But sometimes when, when it goes to the courts, it's not necessarily treated with the severity in which the action in the crime um, warrants. If I could just uh, come in there as well. In terms of Glasgow, the point that was made earlier on about the threat of the legislation and regulations has been so significant in getting uh, local businesses to do the right thing. And in fact, that's probably been enough just to have that there, just to have the aspect that we can actually say, look, you're going against regulations. If you don't do that, get them to do the right thing. I, yeah, I, I echo. I mean, I think it's... Uh, it's been so sort of well received, I guess, uh, from us in terms of uh, the regulatory powers that they have. Uh, obviously, our role has been, as Rebecca saying, working with them on the communication through our resource efficiency programme, which uh, doesn't just talk about energy, but recycling support for businesses all across Scotland. So we've used that as a channel to, to talk to businesses directly uh, about their responsibilities under the regulations and the potential fines, etc. But I do think there is, there's other things, I mean, and, and it is already happening, but it could be done more of, I guess. It's that whole thing about there's other, as well as SEPA officers visiting those types of businesses, there's environmental health officers, there's trading standards officers, there's a whole range of other public servants uh, who, you know, it's about getting them involved in this as well, to, to some extent, to not just to to, to tell on those businesses, but more importantly, to pass the message about responsibility that small businesses, particularly, which are harder to re reach, but are being visited more often, possibly, than SEPA officers on the ground. So I know a lot of work's been done that about training, about sharing uh, information, and, and encouraging uh, you know others to get more involved and uh, talking directly one to one with businesses. So there's, I think, there'd probably be some initiatives there that we could build on to, to make it more successful. Because some of it is just about awareness raising. I think that's what. Corey Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, could I just ask, particularly, um, Rebecca, from a SEPA perspective, um, you'll know that there was the um, Sterling Management School report uh, on um, suggesting that there could be more detail of, um, of the recording of enforcement actions at a given site and more detail on the actual waste at sites and waste streams. And I appreciate this uh, may well be a, a resource capacity for you, but is that something that you think would help the, um, uh, the drive to tackle envir environmental waste crime? We, we're always looking at new ways that we can tackle it in terms of the enforcement and um, communicating this. Um, so, I mean, I, I'd probably discuss this with my colleagues in terms of what we can do practically on the ground to do this, but yes, we need to do more to help um, address waste crime, definitely. And having that education and awareness about it, I think is really, really important. Right. And last but not least, David Stewart. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Can I ask you, in conclusion, a, a very general but important question, and that is what the risks and opportunities are posed by Brexit for Scotland's zero waste plans? To start with Rebecca Walker. Okay, thank you. Um, 
the EU directives have presented us with a very strong framework that have been translated into UK and Scotland law. And for, for us at SEPA, we're working closely with Scottish Government in terms of ad advising them and providing technical advice. In terms of the detail of this, it is quite, um, it is quite difficult to say, but we look, need to look at how this strong framework can continue. We're lucky we have a very, as I mentioned earlier in this session, a very comprehensive strategy to work to. We have Scottish regulation regulations that we're implementing, but this is really complicated and I think it's really early in terms of the actual implications that this is going to have. Um, we need to be aware of all these implications. We're also, in terms of other areas, we are assisting DEFRA as well in terms of the technical capacity when it comes to transplantation and of waste as well. Okay, thank you. Ian? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, it's something we do uh, look at very seriously in our business, uh, as you would imagine, and also obviously with other partners, with SEPA and, and uh, economic agencies as well. Uh, I guess going back to Robin's point, I mean, one of the obvious things is, is the trade of materials. What, what would us, depending obviously what happens uh, in terms of the Brexit settlement, uh, well, what impact, positive or otherwise, would that have on our, our material flow out with going out of Scotland? Uh, but also the impact of raw materials being bought in, bought by our industries here. Uh, so I guess all of that is obviously <laughs> deeply uncertain, uh, which I guess reinforces, uh, for us, emphasises the importance of moving towards a more circular economy, where we're actually making use, more use, uh, economically uh, and environmentally, of the assets that are already deployed in our society in terms of materials and products, mm. and how do we make more of them and create systems which are. Uh, certainly better for the environment, better for our economy, but more importantly, perhaps more resilient, uh, depending on what the outcome is. I'm not trying to be a doom monger here, but I think it reinforces the need that we can really, these opportunities are real and still real and present within Brexit, within Brexit, within Europe or out with Europe uh, and working across the UK. So I guess, yeah, for us, it just reinforces the need that the direction of travel we're on is the right one. Uh, it reinforces the, the, the need for pace uh, but, yeah, on the other side, there is, a, there is a degree of uncertainty. So we are actually trying to attract inward investment, I guess, for some of these facilities we've talked about uh, in terms of reprocessing with uh, enterprise partners. So all of that in terms of attracting investment and getting Scottish companies to invest is, is, can be quite challenging at this moment mm. just because of a degree of uncertainty. What about the impact on the operations of Zero Waste Scotland? Because you have a large proportion of your funding that's drawn from the EU, don't you? Yeah, so at the moment we, yeah, uh, we, we have a considerable amount, uh, over 30 million euros, uh, being supplied through structural funds uh, up, up until 2018. Uh, I guess what goes forward uh, will be a matter for obviously what comes out of the settlement. Uh, I guess that money is, is being used, being matched with Scottish Government money to accelerate our work. So I guess it's all about if we don't have as much money, do, does our pace change? Uh, does it slow down some of the activities or our ability to support some of the opportunities that we see? Uh, and that's something obviously we're very conscious of in, in discussions again with Scottish Government colleagues around that. But uh, it is not just about, with every respect, our money or government money that we get and European money. It's about how do we lever in other investors, whether that's uh, venture funds or banks or, or other mainstream investment uh, that is available to both small medium enterprises and some of the infrastructure projects that we've talked about. So, yeah, it's, it's not going to impact on us in the short term, but it could start to narrow our focus going forward. I think one of the wider, I think one of the wider issues, and uh, none of us obviously can foresee the future yeah. in terms of the negotiations, uh, but um, I would assume that we will be perhaps importing more from non-EU countries. So there are big issues, for example, um, on plastics. Uh, we may then find that we're, we're taking plastics from countries that doesn't comply with EU uh, directives on plastics, which gets back to the problem that we're causing more problems yeah. in the circular economy and not, not less. But I welcome uh, to Tony and Robin's views on the, on the wider issue before I go into specifics. I think, as you said, it remains to be seen. We are certainly noticing just now in terms of the markets that are available, they're much more competitive than they were several years ago. Um, but there's so much in play just now, it's so difficult to actually put a handle on how we'll be affected. Right. Robin. I think I alluded to it earlier, and I think it's, you know, the, when it happened, you know, the cost of export and RDF um, mm. compared to the pound, I think it was about 20% hit. So as, soon, as long as we're relying on export, we're susceptible to that risk uh, of external influences impacting how we can deliver um, across the spectrum of how we handle our resource. So 
while we have that reliance, um, it certainly has to be at the at-risk category um, in terms of the affordability of certain things moving forward if it changes and the cost models change so dynamically. Mm. But the flip side to that, Ian alluded to it, that might create the opportunity to invest in this country. And one of the, one of the big picture issues that concerns me is the whole area of European directives and enforcement. And the European Court of Justice, as you know, is the, the group that guard the guards. They're vitally important to ensure that environment standards across Europe are enforced. And it's quite clear um, that Theresa May is with, wants to withdraw from the European Court of Justice. European Court of Justice. Have the panel any concerns or issues they wish to raise around that point? We have, as well as European law, we have case law from the UK and Scotland. So where we do withdraw from that, it will be following UK and Scottish law that has been made into case law here. And has, has CPAD developed sort of contingency plans in the case we withdraw from European Court of Justice in terms of enforcement? I take your point that there's some, yeah, there's Scottish and UK legislation mm -hmm. that the courts can still rely on. The, the point I'm making. Uh, that we relied heavily on Europe in terms of enforcement <laughs> at a wider level. At the moment, we're uh, um, discussing the Swiss Scottish Government and supporting Scottish Government in this, but we haven't. Um, there's no detail yet. It's too early to say. Okay. Ian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably, I mean, it's probably something uh, I'm aware that these discussions are, are, are ongoing. I think all of that is, yeah, I guess brings uncertainty how all that will work. And again, that you know, for some of the work that we're involved in, working in partnership with SIPA on some of the, the issues around enforcement and, and regulation, but as well as just, again, business uncertainty, all of that creates a degree of uh, uncertainty for investment. And, you know, while well, everybody sees the opportunities, what is the kind of climate that we will all be working in within mm. business investment and obviously regulatory mm. systems? And even for current businesses involved in waste management and resource management, I'm sure that's something that they're keenly observant about at this moment but as he said nobody's you know the detail isn't available for us all to kind of strategize around you know so it is mm. about kind of working up scenarios i guess and trying to understand what mm. what that would look like so mm. it's an evolving picture i think is, is yeah. it and i think the final point i would make is obviously i take effect to rebecca's point that we're perfectly capable of developing within scotland and the uk you know best practice on the environment and there's been lots of <coughs> examples there today mm -hmm. but one of the great strengths of Europe has been best practice on the environment and practical enforcement and a great centre of expertise in, in Brussels around this. Uh, have any of the panel members got any concerns about the loss uh, of this expertise that may be developed uh, once we withdraw through Article 50 from the EU? Uh, Ian? I think just very Sorry. quickly, um, in terms of um, our game plan, we're working to the Zero Waste Scotland plan and it's a robust plan. It's a really good plan. And our own local waste strategy, tackling Glasgow's waste, is built on the premise of the keystones that are within that zero waste plan. So we've got absolutely no problems moving forward with that plan over the next 10 years. I think the one thing I would like to add is a good idea is a good idea, no matter where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and we may not have access to the European Court of Justice, but we'll certainly have access to the outcomes that come from that. And we can still learn from our European neighbours. And as they can learn from us, as they have done with the work Ian's team have done in the circular economy. So it's not going to be a closed shop in terms of any new ideas won't be shared. Mm. Um, a, a good friend of mine always says there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So if the wheel's there, let's go and look at it. Mm -hmm. Scotland Environment Protection Agency, we continue to and will continue to work in partnership with our European partners. There is value in this um, with European partners, with international partners, learning best practice, working together, looking at the opportunities and the challenges together in terms of making the transition to a circular economy and also um, seeing how that can relate to Scotland, definitely. So I, I'd echo that. I don't think, you know, obviously that's incumbent on us to, to, to maintain those links uh, regardless and, and ensure that we're sharing best practice and learning. Uh, and forming these partnerships, but but having said that, not to be naive, there are there are opportunities at the moment, particularly around the circular economy, uh, because as many uh, members will be aware, Scotland is seen as one of the leading uh, nations in the world around that in terms of the, the progress we've made and, and even just the knowledge that we've built up uh, in terms of some of the some of the activities we've been involved in. You know, we are we are being we are sharing that uh, openly with uh, colleagues in Brussels and around Europe. But more importantly, we're we're able to. Uh, 
input to further decisions that European are thinking around, particularly around standards for, for manufacturing, standards for products, uh, going forward, thinking about eco-design and all that, because of what our knowledge is, and we're, we could potentially be influencing that with other nation states in Europe. So I guess it's that bit, as well as sharing it, but if we were excluded from some of those discussions, yes, we would still like to copy them. Uh, or share them when those, these, these standards come out from Europe. That would be something that obviously the Scottish Government would mm -hmm. be keen to look at, but we wouldn't be as involved possibly in the actual shaping mm -hmm. of those. And I think, you know, as an opportunity we have now, seen as a, a leading nation around the circular economy, I think our European colleagues <coughs> appreciate our role in those discussions as well as ourselves. So something we were obviously keen mm -hmm. to, to keep going as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Very briefly, Morris Golden. Um, just a direct question for Ian Gulland with respect to future Zero Waste uh, Scotland funding. Uh, I think um, it would be helpful just to confirm on the record that obviously all uh, jobs of uh, members of staff, irrespective of uh, Brexit, are uh, to remain. Um, but secondly, given your answer earlier, I wonder if you can foresee some opportunities um, irrespective of the level of funding, to be without the restrictions of ERDF funding, which is in, uh, indeed focused on small and medium-sized enterprises, has involved uh, a number of meetings, you know, regulations, form-filling, and you may reflect that there are opportunities to have funding without restrictions to use in Scotland as, as you require. Yeah, I'm not sure about the point about staff. Uh, would you want me to confirm that those? That all staff are permanent <laughs> and will be there yes, for... Yeah, I can confirm that. All our Good. staff are permanent uh, and will remain uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, uh, the thing about ERDF, yeah, so although we are funded, I mean, 30 million uh, euros over the next couple of years is, is significant and it's matched with some Scottish Government money. Uh, obviously, but we have other monies from the Scottish Government which are not inverted commas ring fence for ERDF, so that does allow us to work with businesses out with the scope of the ERDF funding, which, as you say, is primarily focused on SMEs in Scotland uh, around the circular economy and resource efficiency, although as well as that we've, we've uh, allocated some money into the Climate Challenge Fund uh, to support communities uh, who are looking at resource efficiency, more importantly, uh, opportunities around reuse, repair, etc and tackling food waste at a local level so whilst respecting the fact that there is a bit of uh, administration that comes on top of European funding we do have flexibility out with that to provide support to other initiatives as well uh, but I absolutely accept that I mean that's we, we saw that as an opportunity that was worth tackle, taking on in terms of the European funding because it, it expanded our envelope and, and in terms of what we could actually do with it uh, in terms of investment. But yeah, going forward, I mean, if it's not European funding, there might be other monies that are available which don't have the same, uh, I wouldn't say constraints, but administration burdens. But at the end of the day, you know, with respect, it's public money. Uh, so what's good for Europe should be good for, you know, the, the rest of us in terms of the Scottish Government. And we'd like to think that our administration, administrative processes are robust, uh, as they should be, uh, in terms of how we set up our systems and allocate funding and make sure, monitor and evaluate those going forward. Um, can I bring this part of the meeting to a conclusion, uh, thank the witnesses for their evidence today and remind those who have undertaken to write to the committee to, to follow through on that. So thanks very much. I'm going to suspend briefly while we change the panel.
Welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We will now resume taking evidence on waste in Scotland, and we will hear from our second panel. Uh, we are joined by Jim Brown, the Commercial Director of Bin Group, who is just about to join us. I've been had it pointed out to me. Linda Owens, the Director of Entex Solutions. Uh, Barry Turner from the British Plastics Federation, and Martin Gray of Viridor. Uh, welcome. Uh, along today. Thank you very much for your attendance. And we will move to uh, questions and we'll start with Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. I just thought I'd start with a, a very broad question, which is what trends you envisage in waste generation in the coming uh, decade? If you want, I'm quite happy to do that. Um, I mean, we heard we heard earlier about the the trends over over the last ten years, uh, but certainly over the last four to five years, then um, things have have, have levelled out, and there's there's been little change um, if you exclude commercial uh, uh, construction demolition waste, which is which is dependent on uh, economy stuff. Uh, everything else is is pretty settled in terms of commercial, industrial, and household. Um, and that's a good place to be, actually, and I think that will continue to be settled. Um, winding back, we used to talk about um, housing growth and, and, uh, and growth generally affecting waste risings, and as Ian Gullen said before then, um, I think there has been a decoupling of those two. Uh, so I, whilst I would, I would like to see a decrease, um, I think there's some influence on, on, on household and, and, and economic growth uh, against waste risings, which will mean pretty stable for the time being and, and certainly moving forward. Anyone else? Yeah, I think, that's, uh, I think that absolutely is the case. What I think we have seen over the, the last number of years and we will continue to see is uh, a change in the composition of that waste um, as the circular economy really embeds itself. Uh, I'd make a, a very simple observation that um, five, ten years ago, in terms of how we collected glass in Scotland, is very different to how we collect it now. Um, what we do with plastics was very different to what we do with plastics now. And what we um, see is some of that innovation continuing over the years ahead. We're doing some really good work at the moment at uh, UK level with the uh, Green Alliance in terms of some of the companies there who are really at the cutting edge of packaging innovation. And I know we'll come on to this later, but I think that's the real opportunity for Scotland in terms of, yet yeah, we've seen uh, 10 years of investment in recycling infrastructure. Um, the last five years have been about investment in a landfill diversion or energy recovery infrastructure. For us, the big uh, opportunity is where do we go in the next five and ten years and how do we make that case for reinvestment right here in Scotland? And that will absolutely be determined by ongoing innovation in this area. Does any, anyone else want to come in on that? I mean, uh, from a packaging perspective, we've seen considerable lightweighting occur over the last decade. Um, the uh, next decade, I think, we'll see further changes in terms of the way that we shop, um, and that will influence uh, what gets collected from the households. We've already seen um, the internet play a uh, far bigger part in terms of our shopping and we'll continue to see uh, changes. We've seen the supermarkets move away from large format stores to local stores. So all of that will, will have some bearing on the packaging waste that's generated and the sort of waste that's generated. Thank you. Jim Brown, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, just, just briefly, just to back up what some of my colleagues have said. Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, the makeup of waste over the past sort of 10 years or so has changed dramatically. We see it, and I think uh, um, Barry mentioned light weighting. That's certainly something I think that people shop differently. And uh, uh, I think um, that has changed. You know, we, we don't get as much, you know, newspapers and stuff through the, 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 the general way or the, the recycling that we pick up now it tends to be more lightweight materials. Um, so, yeah, I think it, and I think that will continue to change. Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. So obviously those conclusions must be based on uh, data. So how robust is the data that we currently have on Scotland's waste and what are the priorities for improvement as we look ahead to the next decade? Um, data, data has definitely improved. 
and and we're def definitely capturing more than we had. And I know there are there are huge plans within within SEPA um, to automate and 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 make electronic data um, reporting systems uh, consistent. And, and there's a huge piece of work going on that. So I fully support that, and I think that will that will be the key to to ensuring we have the right data. But it's it's all about making sure we're it's it. It's, it's smart data that we're actually collecting and not data for the sake of data. And, and we have been, um, I suppose, in, in the past, part of the problem has been uh, gather lots of data, gather lots of data, but um, in terms of interpretation and what we're actually collecting and why we're collecting that, um, I think <coughs> has, has led to data overload in some respects and, and not less led to consistency. So uh, I am hopeful that the electronic systems will, will give us that consistency and, and, and peace for, for future. Barry Turner, from your experience in data gathering and, and the robustness of the data, compare across uh, between Scotland and other parts of the UK. Um, well, I've seen I've seen the data that's been uh, generated by Zero Waste Scotland on the plastics arising. Um, I think I think the challenge uh, for the for the sector going forward in terms of meeting future targets um, and uh, maximising recycling is our ability to go down to what I'd call a granular level. Um, there was discussion uh, in the earlier session about the number of people living in uh, flats, um, what sort of waste that they generate, how does that compare with others with a curbside scheme. Um, I mean, there was a, there was a, it was quite interesting to see an article uh, uh, last week that was uh, forecasting that uh, in many cities, the kitchen would disappear, <laughs> uh, that people were eating so much food uh, on the go uh, and out, out of their premises that uh, the home kitchen, as we, as we see it today, would change dramatically in the next decade. What impact is that going to have? Um, and also, um, you know, sort of understanding um, the different flows uh, arising from that, uh, particularly the on-the-go uh, consumption. Um, I think that's an area we need to understand far better than we do at the moment. In terms of how Scotland compares to the rest of the UK, is our data quite robust or do you have any concerns about it? Um, I, I can only compare the, um, uh, the, the Scottish data based on population um, and um, the zero waste um, report took down the plastic waste arising. Um, it's, I think that could possibly be looked at further, but I think um, because just based on population and if I compare it with the UK as a whole, it, it's possible that that estimate is still on the high side. Uh, but I, I would come back to the point that I made earlier, I think in terms of how we move things forward, we probably need to take that to a, another level uh, to, to help us in our journey. Okay, okay uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. It's just a quick sup to, from, um, to Kate's Forbes question to Barry Turner. You mentioned that supermarkets are moving to smaller local outlets. And what, in your opinion, is the implication of waste then for that? Will it be more, will it be less? More packaging, for well, instance? I, th I think it's, it's indicative of the way that we're living our lives um, and are likely to live our lives in the future. It's, it's coming back to the comment I made about earlier, the role of on-the-go on consumption versus at-the-home uh, <coughs> consumption of food and drink. Um, and so in terms of the implication, um, if you're having a meal delivered to your home, to your flat, um, that's going to come in a different sort of packaging to the, uh, the meal that you would buy from a supermarket, for example. Um, so I think you need to, need to consider the implications there in terms of shifts in, in the types of packaging that, that will arise because of that. OK. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, convener. Just thinking about achieving Scotland's recycling targets, what needs to happen, in your opinion, for the 2025 target to recycle 70% of Scotland's waste um, to be achieved? Linda Ovens, do you want to start again? <laughs> again, I should start this off. Um, I would, I, I, I certainly feel that um, 
there, there's a huge push on, on municipal waste and household mm -hmm. waste, and I would like to see more done um, on the other sector, on commercial mm -hmm. industrial waste. Um, <coughs> we have about six million tonnes of, of household and commercial industrial waste, of which the household is, is less, is much less than half of that. Um, and the emphasis has, um, the emphasis needs to shift, mm -hmm. I think, away from just talking about what the householders can do more. They've done an awful lot already in terms of getting us into uh, some authorities getting to, to nearly 60% in, in terms of their own recycling levels. Um, but I feel that there's, uh, the, the commercial industrial sector is definitely playing catch up uh, in that section. And, and that's where the biggest changes are, and gains are going to get to to get to 70. And I think if I might add, um, from a Penon perspective, we are the owners of Viridor. We are one of the largest investors in recycling and energy recovery infrastructure in the UK, um, currently investing £500 million um, in Scotland. This is a critical one for us. I think this is a real opportunity, and I think Scotland um, is at the forefront of the circular economy space. Um, in terms of what we need to do, I think we need to recognise, which I think Scotland has done very well, that this isn't just an issue of environmental obligation. It's an issue of economic opportunity. And how do we embed this right into the heart of government in terms of an economic strategy? How do we link resource use right into a new industrial strategy? I think that's what Scotland's done really well. Um, I think it's globally recognised for this as we travel across Europe, as I'm fortunate enough to do. Genuinely, the world is looking at Scotland in terms of the work that it's doing in this space. Um, what I would say is, um, as we heard this morning, we have come a huge way from that point when, when even I was a boy, where everything went in that one bin to where we've got to just now in quite a short space of time. Uh, seven or eight years ago, when I entered the industry, the talk was about the fact that there was no um, real infrastructure in Scotland. That has come on leaps and bounds in the last six or seven years. I talked about the last maybe 10 years investment in advanced recycling infrastructure. The last four or five years is about what do we do with the stuff that we can't recycle. Um, and the next 10 years, five, 10 years, will all be about how do we really grasp those circular economy opportunities? But I am genuinely very optimistic uh, about where we've got to. Um, about a year and a half ago, two years, Viridor produced a paper which was a set of policy asks from Scottish Government. Um, most of those I'm genuinely pleased to say the Scottish Government has taken on board. And some of those were about two main themes. One was around uh, aggregation of materials. So in Scotland, the fact that we've got 32 different local authorities often collecting material in different ways. As an investor in infrastructure, um, that makes uh, investment decisions quite difficult. So we heard this morning about the household uh, recycling uh, commitment. I think that will make a huge difference over time. We also heard uh, this morning um, uh, about the, the aggregation of materials through the brokerage service. I think that has the potential to, to add to the investment case as well. But also the other challenges, one is uh, aggregation of material, the other one is about quality, recyclic quality. Um, and again, we heard from, from SEPA and others about the MRF code of practice. Um, and again, for us, that's the real opportunity to, to bring that fresh focus because the point of recycling isn't just about recycling to hit a target. It's about how do we create resources in the Scottish economy to allow large manufacturers and remanufacturers to come here and invest and create jobs in Scotland. And absolutely, that's what we're doing right. Doesn't mean there's not challenges along the way still to achieve, but many of those building blocks that will allow that next generation investment to come to Scotland are in the process of being put in place. Just uh, add to that as well, but just by saying, I mean, speaking from, uh, I, I think first of all, I would say that, that you know we fully support um, the, the the waste hierarchy and the, and the good work that, that Zero Waste Scotland are doing, and you know, in putting um, all the regulation um, into place. And I, I find, you know, as working for Bin Group, we have a lot of interaction with uh, <clears throat> colleagues from other companies across uh, across the rest of the UK, and they look 
up here with envy a lot of the time as to you know the the the, the good work that is taking place. Um, however, what I would say is I think uh, I would agree with uh, Linda. I think um, a huge focus on on um, household waste and uh, you know and rightly so. I mean I. I Vested interest as a householder myself, and I, I, you know, I want to, I want to see uh, the, the 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 overall picture um, uh, improving, and I think you know it will continue to do so. But I think there has to be um, focus on uh, the commercial sector. I mean, as a business, we don't collect household waste, um, uh, but I think uh, that, that there needs to be a lot more uh, focus on on the commercial and industrial sector and uh, how we can uh, make things make things better uh, there. We put a lot of time and effort into it as a business, you know, by promoting uh, recycling, promoting best practice. Um, uh, but I think, you know, as a kind of joined up thing, you know, b b between all, you know, vested, uh, vested interests and parties, uh, I think we should be looking closer at how we can, how we can improve the, the overall picture in Scotland. Uh, moving on, uh, Mark Roscoe. Hi, um, plastic. Um, can you give us some background on plastics, type of plastics um, that are being uh, generated in Scotland, how they're being processed, where they're actually going? Uh, you've mentioned already about light weighting, um, but can you give us some detail about the, the nature of this market and how it's being sorted in Scotland? I will attempt to do, but as always, getting down to... Uh, a regional level is is quite difficult. Um, if you if you look at the total picture uh, in terms of the total plastics uh, generated, um, I think of um, waste arisings um, compared to all waste. Um, the uh, the figure is quite quite low because um, of the lightweight nature of the product. So uh, you're probably looking at, um, based on the, the, the figures that were being mentioned this morning in terms of total waste generated in Scotland, um, you're probably looking at around about 5% of that is, is attributable to, uh, to plastics. In terms of that, that figure, that breaks down 60% uh, roughly is, is associated with packaging. Um, the other 40% is various um, other areas, including building waste, including um, um, other industrial uh, waste that are, are generated where plastics is used. Uh, there are a wide range of polymers in use um, uh, that are selected based on their ability to do the job. Um, the um, in terms of what's collected for recycling, um, there are various initiatives in place um, uh, across um, the different polymer streams, um, uh, including industry-led initiatives um, that are focused on particular um, waste streams, uh, such as PVC, for example, um, as well as um, schemes that basically are, are farming the plastics that come back through the household stream. Um, of the plastics that come back through the household stream, uh, a number of polymers are widely recycled, including HDPE, LDPE and PET, um, uh, with strong markets uh, for those um, uh, materials. Um, where, where are they going, the plastics? Um, a large percentage, if you look at the UK as a whole, um, probably around about 60% of that has been exported from these shores uh, for re further reprocessing. Um, the, um, and uh, that's probably likely to continue, uh, although it will be very much influenced by the, what happens as a result of Brexit, um, it's got to be said. Um, the, um, but around about 60% of it is exported from the UK. OK. And I guess in terms of... I did order to give you some uh, context there. The plastics that we see coming through our facilities um, will be collected at our materials recycling facility. Our nearest specialist polymer facility is at Skelmersdale near Liverpool. So those uh, will go there to be uh, effectively pelletised, and then they will be traded... Um, 
either across the UK or across the globe where there is a market. But I think that goes back to the point of what are we really trying to achieve here in Scotland with the circular economy. And that's why it's so important to recognise this is an economic opportunity to make sure there is more investment, more infrastructure uh, in Scotland, and also to make sure then that manufacturing jobs that can flow from that um, are in Scotland. And I go back to the point and the way to achieve that is through that aggregation, because what stopped uh, a plastics facility coming to Scotland at the moment? It's the fact that um, we have a disaggregated market uh, across Scotland's 32 local authorities. And if we could pull those resources, as the Scottish Government's vision seeks to do, then that makes a whole different investment case for uh, investing in a polymer facility in Scotland. And if we are then to achieve that, that creates the opportunity of what do we do when that polymer is in Scotland and can be remanufactured in Scotland. Okay. Are there, are there any particular polymers that are very difficult to recycle? I mean, obviously we see films as being difficult, um, obviously quite low in terms of weight, but going back to Ian Gullen's point earlier on, presumably in terms of carbon, you know, they're still a high value resource. So are there particular types of plastic which uh, remain problematic in terms of recovering and, and uh, reprocessing? Um, if, if, if I was to generalise, the, um, I think the challenge is more uh, what you want to do with those plastics when they're recycled. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, I think we started the journey on recycling plastics, trying to possibly do the most difficult thing, which was take a lot of them back into food contact materials. Um, the, um, that is always technically challenging because you've got to ensure that those materials are safe to be used in contact with food. Um, and um, that, that journey was, um, should always be pursued if, 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 if you can, can make it, but you should never ignore the other opportunities. Um, and there are great opportunities that we're seeing now for a number of um, polymers to be uh, that were traditionally looked at as more difficult polymers to recycle to be used in a variety of different applications. Um, those include everything from uh, flood defence, uh, railway sleepers, and, and a wide range of, of different applications. In addition, um, I would also say the traditional focus has always been on mechanical recycling, and in the future, I think we will see other forms of recycling, which will open opportunities as well for um, uh, recycling the more difficult structures uh, in the future as well. Just maybe to pick up on another point to give another uh, word of optimism here. I think if you look at what's in the media around plastics at the moment, um, recent months we've seen quite a large focus around um, black packaging, black food trays, um, which are largely uh, unrecyclable. I think if you see the pace that the industry is moving now in response to that consumer demand to do something different, the likes of Marks and Spencer's co-op moving very fast on detectable black plastics and then looking at opportunities in the UK as to uh, where they could make investments with partners. Um, I think that's hugely encouraging, and I think we'll see some really big progress in that area in the coming months. Mm -hmm. Any other views on that at all? Um, it, it may have changed, but up until recently then, agricultural film and agricultural um, baling material was a, another one that was, was problematic. And again, had the same things, that uh, it couldn't be recycled back into agricultural bales um, because of, of standards of quality, um, again, for that material. Yeah, I mean, I think... Overall, I mean, plastics are, and there are problematic plastics out there. Um, and I, I would say probably most, if not all, of the plastic generated in Scotland, plastic waste generated in Scotland, leave Scotland. Um, uh, and I think uh, when we're looking at the circular economy and a, what we're trying to do, you know, there are some good things happening. Um, we are involved in a project, it's called Project Beacon with Zero Waste Scotland, and that's looking at hopefully something that will be a success story going forward, looking at um, mechanically recycling plastics, you know, actually sorting out all the different plastics into their plastic types, and then chemically recycling them and turning them into things like fuel, naphtha, 
that sort of thing. Uh, so that project has just been, uh, we've recently just been uh, granted some funding to take that forward along with some other uh, parties as well uh, in conjunction with Zero Waste Scotland. So that would be a terrific, you know, uh, we're very confident that the <clears throat> what we're looking at will um, improve the picture in Scotland and help deliver that, that circular economy mm -hmm. uh, story. Okay. In terms of packaging, um, where do you see the greatest opportunities in terms of minimising the amount of packaging that we're generating? So not just recycling, but waste minimisation. You've already mentioned light weighting. Uh, but where do you see uh, producer responsibility fitting into this as well? Um, I th there's a, quite a lot of change that I think we'll see come about um, <coughs> in terms of the sort of packaging that will get used in the future, and that will be very dependent on um, our ability to um, take those products and, and recycle them further in the future. We've already seen pouches, uh, laminated pouches, come into the market. They present unique problems in terms of uh, recycling. So those, uh, those problems are now being looked at uh, by the industry to see if we can get a win-win because the pouch, can, uh, compared to a rigid container, can take <coughs> roughly 80% of the weight of material uh, away. The challenge then is what you do with it at the end of, end of its life. Um, we now, as an industry, have um, established a, uh, a group, a working group, at a European level to look at how we can re-engineer those st structures so that we actually maintain the barrier properties that you need in the material so we don't compromise the, uh, the packaging in that way uh, so that we can bring continued development uh, to give further opportunities to reduce uh, the weight of, uh, of packaging placed on the market. So I think you'll see more movement in, in that area in the future. Um, mm -hmm. um, over and above that, we have an initiative uh, called uh, PIRAP, which brings together the waste management industry, and brings together the retailers, the brands, and uh, as what to, together with our industry and the recyclers to look at how we can actually change designs uh, to make them more easy to recycle, uh, and whether that's removing a sleeve of, of, from a bottle and replacing it with a label, or it's um, making sure that the materials in use in a particular packaging design are compatible so that they don't present problems when they get into the waste chain. And so we're doing a lot of, lot of work in that area as does well. Does that have widespread industry buy-in or do you still see you know, the manufacturers of Pringles and other uh, companies that have got problematic packaging sort of resisting that or are they on board as well? Are you all working together to try and reduce um, and minimise? Clearly... Um, the packaging suppliers um, um, are part of the chain and only part of the chain. Uh, the design by the brand or the retailer, uh, if they want to go in a particular direction, we can't say to them, we're not going to supply that packaging. Um, so, um, however, having said that, uh, with the focus on the circular economy package in, in Europe, I think most brands and uh, retailers will be forced to look at uh, the design of packaging that they use in the future and will have to make changes. Whether that comes from consumer pressure or whether it, uh, or whether it just comes from best practice in terms of sustainability, I think we'll see change in that, in that space occur more rapidly in the future now. Okay. Any other comments on packaging? I would just say, I think, um, uh, I think the key is just something Barry touched on at the very end here. I think it's sustainable procurement um, um, because, you know, taking it back to a local level, some of the clients that we've dealt with in the past in the drinks, the food and drinks industry, um, the, the design people were pretty much disengaged from the procurement people and the, 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 it wasn't a joined up chain within, within one, you know, one company. Uh, so I think we've progressed an awful lot in that front and I think companies are now sitting together uh, and looking at how they can design out um, uh, non-recyclable materials from their packaging. Uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, I think there's still some businesses probably need to come on board with that but I think there is a lot of, I, th I think that I think the, 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 the profile uh, of, of that element of, of packaging uh, is much higher than, than it was before. 
Thank you, Mark. Can I just take you back to the subject of, of plastics? I think Richard Lyle wants to come in on something, but just, just to get this on the record, can you give us a feel for where uh, plastic drinks bottles actually sit in terms of contribution to the whole plastics sort of scenario? And within that, um, what's your best guess on what the impact of a deposit return scheme would have on the rates of recapture and recirculation? Okay. Um, well, if you look at the plastic bottles that are likely to be affected by a DRS if it was introduced, um, you are probably looking at 5% um, of all plastic waste arising. Um, so, um, and then, of course, you've got to put that into context in terms of total waste arising uh, as well. So it, will, it would only make a very, very small impact on the achievement of Scotland's overall uh, uh, targets. Um, the, um, uh, so, uh, uh, and the, the, obviously the performance of the DRS has obviously got to improve on the current level of recycling that we're actually achieving. Um, otherwise, you will have just invested in an infrastructure uh, 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 at an additional cost for no 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 extra gain. So, so from experience elsewhere in Europe, was there an upsurge in the, num the amount of plastic of that type that was came back into circulation because of DRS, or was it or was it negligible? Um, well, if you if you look at the UK as a whole, um, if you look at the plastics bottle um, and what gets collected um, uh, and of the type that would be affected by a DRS, you're probably looking at a figure of 60% uh, that we're achieving in the UK as a whole. There are parts of the UK where we actually achieve above that rate. Um, Wales, for example, I think they're currently achieving a rate of around about 75%. Um, if you look at DRS schemes, many of which were introduced in the 70s, 80s, and obviously packaging mix has changed a, long, a lot since then, uh, they vary in performance rates from anything in the 50s right the way through the 90s. Okay. And um, so it's way where you think we would be in that spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, that's useful to get on the record through Richard Lyle. I'd be interested, you heard Glasgow earlier talking about recycling rates and how they're 29th out of 32 councils, 25%, whereas Angus is 60%. Would you agree that because of the makeup of the calibre of houses, Glasgow has a lot of flats, uh, tower blocks, that they need to really... Uh, drill down and, and get people involved in these houses in order to improve their rates? Uh, I, th I think, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd pass this over to other comments, but one brief comment. I mean, obviously there are unique challenges with, with, um, with people living in flats, particularly where the, those flats have been designed many, many years ago um, and have got no infrastructure built into them to allow the residents to recycle the streams of materials that we want to. So, yes, I do think there are unique challenges there that require a, a tailor-made solution for that sort of sector of the population, would be my view. But I'll, I'll, I'll pass that to other colleagues, really. I think I might broaden that out just to Scotland as a whole in terms of where are we with public attitudes to recycling. We've done quite a lot of work in this space, so we do uh, an annual Viridor Recycling Index, which looks at public attitudes right across uh, the UK. And I think there's, there's probably four key facts that I would leave you with. Um, eight in 10 people see recycling as a valuable resource, but 60% of people aren't confident they know what can be recycled. Now, I've been in the industry for seven, eight years, and Quite often, I'll be picking up uh, a material type, and I don't know what should be happening with that as well. So if that's me, I can understand that, that public confusion over that. One of the elements as well that was picked up in the, the earlier discussion was the lack of consistency. And 76% of Scots say they are extremely frustrated that uh, recycling collections vary 
across the country. So these add to some of the problems of low participation. But quite interestingly, 79% of Scots say that they would recycle more if they could see the economic benefit of that going back into public services. So the more material is contaminated, the higher the cost to councils to recycle that. But actually, if they could see that uh, as a result of their actions, money was being saved and reinvested in local public services, that would encourage uh, more recycling. So going back to Ian Gullen's point this morning, I think communication is central to this. I don't think we've done enough to, to sell that message, although there's excellent work going on across the country. But that would be a key fundamental element. We've got to take the public with us, and we've still got a long way to go in terms of achieving that. About that um, survey that you've done, have you published that? Yeah, it is published, and I can leave a copy with the committee. That me, thank you. Would you say that polystyrene, which makes up quite a lot of packaging, which I hate to bits because it breaks and, and blows all over the place and you don't know where to put it, is that recyclable? Um, polystyrene is recyclable, can be recycled. The challenge is, because it is particularly lightweight, um, is getting enough volume back to, to make it economic to do so. Having said that, um, uh, we've got to be careful that um, we don't lose some of the advantages that come with that material, because although I, I can understand your frustration, uh, it does offer fairly unique um, protection um, in terms of absorption um, and also um, in terms of insulation, so it does play a role. Um, and uh, uh, but yes, it, it, it can be challenging getting enough volume back to make it worthwhile, and that's why it's not currently collected. Thank you for that, uh, Finlay Carson. Uh, um, I had three questions to ask on treatment infrastructure. I'm going to put them all together to hopefully you, you can address all the points. Uh, take out, uh, compact them to take out some of the wastage. Um, <laughs> We've, oh. we've had, <laughs> listen, that was a poor attempt. Um, we've, we've had uh, quite a bit of enthusiasm about how we're moving forward in Scotland, but are the panel confident uh, that the optimum waste infrastructure is being developed in Scotland? For example, looking at uh, type, location and capacity of facilities. Uh, and with that in mind, is there any particular sectors or materials where Scotland is particularly well placed uh, to, to develop further? And on the back of that, what would further developments, uh, what would they be effect on the amount of uh, waste that Scotland imports and exports? Then, um, just in terms of um, what I think we've, we've done well, and I'll maybe leave one example with you in terms of that. In 2013, the um, Scottish Government had a vision that it wanted to boost sustainability, as we heard this morning, in our number one export, Scotch whisky. Um, as a result of that, the Scottish Government decided that it wanted to develop further uh, processing capacity in that area. Um, because of that policy direction from Scottish Government, Viridor invested £25 million in genuinely one of Europe's most advanced glass recycling facilities uh, at Newhouse. That not only boosts the sustainability um, of recycling in Scotland, but also really helps uh, with the Scotch whisky industry and is a real economic driver for investment in the area. And also the interesting example about that one, uh, linking to SEPA's point, that was developed in a former waste crime site that was closed by SEPA and other partners. It's a really good example of when we try and fit all those pieces together, how that can work. Um, in terms of what the opportunities are, I think uh, my view very firmly would be that those are around plastics. I think that's where we're starting to see across the UK and across Europe um, the most rapid innovation in that space. Plastic is a part of our life, but the two examples that I would give are, we talked about very briefly, black plastics and the pace that that's moving at. But also think back eight months ago on the back of the... Hugh Fenley Whitting Styles, BBC War and Waste, Hugh's War and Waste, the public outcry at the fact that many coffee cups weren't recyclable and the rapid pace of change from the coffee companies, uh, etc., in that space. So for me, that's where committees like this and work like this um, have real potential to, 
to drive that investment case. Um, and I think that's where we're going to make the most progress in Scotland, is, is probably plastics for me. I think, I think that's... Um, we're, we're always keen to be looking at pilots. I mean, if you take polystyrene as an example, we are currently working together with... Uh, um, as it so happens, uh, Welsh Government um, and looking at uh, trialling how we actually overcome the barrier that I was, I was referring to before. Uh, and I think uh, in terms of how we move forward, I think we've got, got to be constantly looking at opportunities to do things differently that respond to uh, the unique challenges uh, that we have. And whether that's um, uh, ensuring consistency so that you can bring enough volume together and contract with that volume to allow a plastic facility to, to be built in Scotland, or whether it's looking at um, uh, how we actually overcome the unique challenges of uh, recycling from people that are living in flats. Um, you know, we, we, we need to be moving into those places if we're going to make real, real progress in the future and look, looking at how we can make a difference. I think, um, generally, have we, have we got optimum infrastructure? Is it coming? Um, no, I don't think so at the moment. Um, I think I, it makes me really sad that, that we lost our paper mills and our, our glass plants and our, our steel mills that, that could have contributed so much to, to what we now need in terms of this new infrastructure and, and generating the circular economy uh, requirements. Um, I think we should do more in terms of what I would term intermediate facilities. So um, facilities like we heard uh, Glasgow mention, uh, they're, they're smart materials recycling facilities that can take multi-materials and improve the quality of them so that, so that those can then enter a market and have a value and, and, and trade as commodities in their own right. Um, it's great that we've got some single stream ones, but I think um, to really make the difference on, on the low recycling councils like Glasgow, I think it's, it's entirely appropriate for, for Glasgow to, to do that, where it's, it's really struggling to... Um, well, I think generally we, we struggle with, with recognition of material types uh, within our bins as householders, and I think we do as a nation. Um, and in terms of quality then, the recognition is, is, is the best, where you can actually recognise what the item is. So is it a plastic bottle? <coughs> Um, it's 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 not it doesn't come under a generic name that nobody understands. Um, so I think if we if we're going to continue to to ask people to do things that they don't quite understand what they are, then we need facilities that take those um, um, ambiguous items um, and and sort them and, and improve that quality for the market. Um, am I confident that waste infrastructure is right in Scotland? Um, no, um, I'm not. I think there's massive, you know, lots of good work has taken place, and I feel as if I'm repeating myself, I've said that already, there is genuinely is, but um, no, I, I, I don't think it is I think there's there's lots more uh, we can do I mentioned the Project Beacon thing the, the, the project we've got on the go with Zero Waste Scotland just now, and I'll, I'd be happy to share that with the, the, the committee, the details on that um, that's one example of how things can be made better uh, in Scotland, but I would come back to the point um, that uh, you know the, the energy recovery capacity that, that, that we have in building Scotland in, in Viridor, uh, I've got the plant uh, um, in Dunbar and the plant in um, Glasgow and the, and the two others that were referred to earlier, is almost completely taken up with local authority uh, waste, local authority tonnage, which leaves a huge void um, in Scotland in that that area uh, for residual non-recyclable waste. So I heard what Ian, from, Ian Gullen said earlier on, um, he sort of, I suppose, dis disagreed with, with, with Robin. I share Robin's view, I think, come 2021. Uh, we, I'm not going to say we'll have a gun held to our heads in terms of price for, for moving export to materials that, that, that you were asking about. I mean, we currently export uh, because we've got no alternative. Uh, we would love an alternative here. We don't have one. So we export RDF and SRF, refuse-derived fuel and solid recover fuel, uh, to uh, Europe. Um, we've already had an increase uh, this year due to the, the, what happened to the pound with the, the, the Brexit thing. Um, and we are concerned 
uh, about what's going to happen um, come 2021 when we have no infrastructure in place, none. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I uh, I think it's something that that, that we, we really need to be working on now. You know, I, I think it's something that, that that's hugely hugely important. Um, uh, if we can build capacity in Scotland, then it, 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 there's all various different types of facilities, you know, combined, combined heat and energy plants that, you know, you, we look to mainland Europe and there's lots of good examples of that. And yeah, that, that there is maybe perhaps some overcapacity, but there's lots of good examples that we can learn from, learn from their mistakes. You know, we're not building a prototype. Uh, we can learn from other people. And uh, I think it's important that, that, that we, you know, not tomorrow, today, we need to be looking at that. Okay. Just, come in with just one more example of projects. Um, agricultural waste was touched on recently. There is within Scotland, as, as I'm sure the committee is aware, a recycling plant for agricultural plastics. Um, and the, um, that plant, um, the main challenge that that plant has, has faced has, has been one of collection. Um, so, um, it, it, it almost comes back to what I was saying earlier on the um, on the infrastructure. Um, if 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 we can collect the volume, the technical solutions uh, will follow uh, to enable us to to recycle these materials. But the the first step is absolutely critical. Actually, making sure you've got the infrastructure in place that actually optimises the collection of material. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Uh, could I seek views from the panel on compliance and enforcement issues and uh, on, on the, the really specific detail, please, on the compliance rates uh, for requirements for businesses to present key recyclables, metal, plastic, glass, paper and card separately for collection, and also, if relevant to your business or your knowledge, um, uh, the food businesses to present waste food separately um, as per the waste regulations of 2012. Uh, if you could comment on that, and if, um, if you're able to take in so much at once, I'm just conscious of time. So if, it is, if, it, if it's relevant, if we could just take all the, the, the points at once, please. Um, just SEPA's new integrated authorization framework and enforcement tools, whether they have, in your view, had an improvement on compliance to date. So I'm sorry there's rather a, a range of questions, uh, but... Obviously, just if you, if you have a specific knowledge <coughs> about a specific aspect of that, just focus on that, if you could. So who wants to go first? I'm looking at Linda Owens yet again. <laughs> I'll take that head on. Yes, of course. There's a lot. There is a lot in that. Um, I mean, in terms of because because I do I do want to see more in terms of business business recycling, and they do have things that they're supposed to be doing at the moment. Um, and I do recognise the good work that that CPA is in do, is doing with the fixed penalty notices and and do that. Um, but I think it's it's the tip of the iceberg on some of that, and um, I, I wouldn't want to see. Uh, well, I think CPA within the resources that they have are doing what they can, um, but it's nearly a business at a time, um, and and there is there are a huge amount of businesses that that are not complying, but are, uh, some that are not even aware um, that they are required to to comply at the moment. Um, I think how I would like to. To fix that, I think we, we talked, uh, there's, there's things in the papers about um, the, the smoking ban and how that happened overnight and, and uh, the single-use carry bag overnight change. And the difference with that is that um, everybody was aware of that and everybody enforced that. Um, so if you were a pub owner or if you were a supermarket, no, you can't have a bag, you need to pay 5p, um, you can't smoke in here. And every member of the public was enforcing that as well. So it was, it was self-regulated. Um, and it, that's definitely not the case in terms of um, uh, understanding and, and business awareness. So, so that's a huge communication message, message for all of us. And I think if we all got behind that, then we would see a um, huge increase in, in, in business uh, uptake and, and participation in, in the regulations. Other comments um, from the panel? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to on, yeah. on integrated authorisations. Yeah. Um, then I haven't seen as much, uh, too, too much change at the moment. Again, that's still going through the, the kind of implementation process uh, and is still coming into effect. The, the consultation on some of that is, is just finished. Um, but welcome that in terms of uh, streamlining and, um, and, and consistent messaging across all enforcement. Yeah. Thank you. Other panel members? 
Um, I would maybe just comment on the, the overall compliance rates and maybe look at it from our own business perspective. Um, I think uh, with regard to, you mentioned card, paper, plastics and, and, and uh, glass. Um, on the whole, uh, it's an ongoing challenge, <laughs> I would say, uh, for, for us as a business. Uh, um, tackling contamination, you know, we, we, we have to educate our, our drivers to who, who are a, the guys at the coal face who are collecting uh, those those waste streams, um, and we do encounter uh, ongoing issues with contamination. But but we we as a business communicate with our customers and try and improve that picture. Uh, I think it is getting better, um, and I think it's because. Uh, we're continually communicating with them. Um, and I think that comes back to the, the, the message that I think what we really need to do is have real focused public education <coughs> campaigns. Uh, I think probably each local authority in many ways is, I know there've been lots of national things like, you know, love food, hate waste, that sort of thing, which, is, which has been very positive. But I think a lot of the, the local authorities of, you know, 32 local authorities doing maybe 28 different things in terms of putting the message out there. And I think there needs to be a more, you know, a combined, a coherent campaign and along the lines of, you know, the, the sort of smoking ban, that getting a single message out there about what we're trying to achieve. Um, that would be my uh, comments on that. Anyone else? <clears throat> no. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, just to, to, to wrap up this part, um, David Stewart. You deferred my question at the last uh, panel, but what assessment have you all made um, on the possible effects of Brexit? Have you set up particular contingency plans to look at the effect that Brexit may have on your own industry? So Again, I maybe pick that up. Uh, firstly, I think the industry as a whole, to take it from that perspective, has done quite a huge amount of work around Brexit. Um, we have looked uh, carefully at the risks and also the opportunities. I may draw the committee's attention to a report by Policy Exchange uh, called Going Round in Circles, uh, developing a new approach to waste policy following Brexit, which I would commend to the committee. I think it, that looks at some of the opportunities to maintain that focus on uh, the environmental opportunity of what we are trying to uh, achieve here. I, I would go back to the point from a business and an investor perspective, what I think Scotland does very well is that it has that ambitious policy agenda matched by the realism of how do we get there. And what it also has is that long-term policy support and also that regulatory framework, which both together give that investor confidence. So that whole uh, combined raft of packages um, from the household uh, recycling charter in particular that's what's going to make the difference, and that's what's going to continue to make Scotland an attractive uh, place to invest. And I think maybe my last comment on that, I think what's also particularly important in Scotland is that cross-party support for what we're trying to achieve here, and the fact that it's not just an environmental obligation, but it's an economic opportunity. And if Scotland keeps to that, that remit, uh, and that strong policy agenda, I think that will continue to make Scotland an attractive place to invest. We, we uh, as an industry, um, have, have looked at the situation. We've looked at the situation as it might impinge on skills. Um, yeah. Obviously, um, the, uh, uh, some uncertainty there in terms of our ability to be able to uh, secure labour in the future. Um, so um, we've, we are taking steps to uh, try and make sure that we can compensate for any risks in that area. Um, economic growth risks, um, that's the biggest uncertainty, I guess, for, uh, for us as an industry um, because of the uncertainty around exchange rate um, around uh, tariffs, uh, depending on the, the nature of uh, the, the actual exit when it's finally uh, negotiated. 
Um, again, um, the, uh, it's very difficult to uh, offset those, uh, those risks. Uh, there is going to be an element of uh, inevitable cost inflation, probably, as a result of those risks. Uh, this is going to affect a lot of sectors. Um, uh, in terms of legislation, <clears throat> our view as an industry is because our industry exports in common with man many industries and the EU is an important export market. Um, legislation as it affects our industry will probably still be framed by and large in the EU. It will be tweaked when it comes into the UK. I'm sure that will continue. <clears throat> but um, because we will wish to continue to to export, we will also take a lead, continuing lead from Europe. Okay. Linda? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, generally, I'm, I'm quite relaxed about what, what Brexit might be and, and, and what leaving the, uh, the EU might be um, in terms of, of materials trading, given that the majority of materials that we're trading are, are globally traded anyway, so there's not a huge link to, to, to Europe. Um, and the majority of, of global trade is, is, is linked um, through OECD countries and um, the Baal or Basel Convention. Um, so I would expect that all to continue, um, uh, to whatever happens. Legislation and regulation then, um, I've been called on a, a number of times by um, global companies to then um, to, to teach them about European law and about European legislation. Leg regulation, um, <coughs> given that it's, it's recognised as the strictest in the world. So I, I wouldn't see that we, we would um, move away from that uh, in any means. And, and, and just not being in the EU doesn't mean that we can't follow the best, uh, the best uh, parts in Scotland. Um, RDF is probably the only thing that I have concerns about, and an export of RDF, refused-derived fuel. Um, and that is a market that um, is, is diminishing al already. Um, the demand for that capacity in, in other EU countries is, is growing, as, as everyone has an EU 50% um, recycling uh, target to meet. So all of Eastern Europe is asking for that capacity, that, the same as we are. Um, but I would see that, uh, Sipa mentioned it earlier, um, on, in terms of transfrontier shipment um, requirements, I can see them getting tighter. And um, uh, economics changing, uh, not just on, on gate fees for facilities, but um, emissions and, and shipping and, and haulage costs and, and, and uh, border control uh, of, of being actually getting that trade to, uh, to Europe. So, so I think that, that would be my risk area. Um, and and we, we talked earlier about capacity in Scotland to, to mitigate that risk and, and a lack of that at the moment. Um, I, think, I think it probably remains to be seen um, what impact uh, Brexit uh, will have, although we do have some concerns that I think have been alluded to earlier, certainly exporting of material, whether it be RDF uh, and SRF, or whether that be actually recyclates that are going uh, to predominantly uh, mainland Europe. So I think that would be the, the, the concerns for me um, uh, for our industry. Um, also, though, I would agree with what Ian uh, Gullen said earlier. I think uh, we'll continue uh, to share ideas. I think we'll continue to learn um, from each other, uh, both in terms of legislation, regulation, and, and just good practice. Uh, I, I think that will continue. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, I think that a lot of people, uh, even within Europe, are looking to Scotland at some of the good work that, that is going on with the circular economy and such like. And I think, I think those relationships uh, will continue, but no doubt there will be there will be challenges around things like labour that that, uh, that Barry mentioned um, and uh, and exporting. Thank you, Peter. Um, do any of the panel members have any concerns about uh, enforcement in the future of European directives? Obviously, we won't be in Europe because clearly it's looking like we're going to withdraw from the European Court of Justice, which. Um, are the kind of guardians on European-wide, uh, of all things European, on the environment? Hmm. Is it something that's appeared in any of your contingency planning, or is it not seen as a central issue for your industry? I don't think it anything to add to what was, uh, what was answered earlier. Seems not. Right. Seems. Okay. Thank you.
Oh, well, thank you very much for your evidence today. It's contributed greatly to the sum of knowledge. And if there is anything you want to follow up on, please feel free to, uh, to, to write to the committee. So thank you very much for your time. Um, the third item on our agenda today... Uh, all right, you're not being rude by leaving. It's OK. Thank you. The uh, third item on our agenda today is consideration of a negative instrument, the Environmental Impact Assessment, Miscellaneous Amendments, Scotland Regulations, 2017, SSI, 2017-168. Can I ask if any members have any comments to make upon that? So is the committee therefore agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? Okay, thank you. At its next meeting on the 27th of June, the committee will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform on the Wild Animals Travelling in Circuses Scotland Bill and also seek general, a general update on her wider portfolio. As agreed, Ellie will now move into private and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.